Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully we've got many of you um, joined up now. I'll probably be having a few more join us in the next couple of minutes, but we'll make a start. Um, so on behalf of Blue Marine Foundation, welcome very much to this afternoon's Cuttlefish Symposium. I'm Sam Fanshaw. I'm UK Marine Projects Manager with Blue, and I'm delighted to see that we should be having over 150 joining us this afternoon to share what we know about cuttlefish and their fishery and to start a collaborative discussion about what is needed to protect their populations and establish a sustainable and viable fishery for the future. So just firstly, I'd just like, like to make you aware of a few things which will hopefully help everyone get the most out of the event. Um, please be aware that the event is being recorded and that recording has started. Um, your video and mic will have automatically be been turned off, um, but there'll be opportunities for questions at the end of each session. Um, if you could use the Q&A button, um, to post your questions during presentations. That's at the bottom of your screen on your taskbar. Um, and if you can also vote for any particular questions that you want to um, filter up to the top so that those get answered first. Then during the open forum sessions, please use the raise hand function. Um, and then when the chair invites you to speak, speak um, please remember to unmute and if you like, um, put your video on as well. And for any technical questions, we've got Paul and Becky from Mindfully at Wired Communications, and they'll be working in the background to support you. So just use the chat function in the bottom and uh, they'll be able to um, help you out. And uh, there's Paul and Becky already on the chat saying that they're there for you. So um, also, if you'd like to tweet about the event, can you please use um, Blue Marine Foundation's Twitter handle um, and hashtag Cuttlefish. So why cuttlefish? Um, I'm sure that you've all got one, if not many reasons why you've joined us this afternoon. Um, but for Blue, some of the key points which make us concerned about this species are its life cycle, which makes it vulnerable to overexploitation. Um, it's targeted by both inshore and offshore fleets during some of those key life stages. It's also a non-quota species and there's no national management or effort restrictions but it is an important fishery for small scale inshore fishermen. But with the vast majority of landings um, being made by the offshore trawler fleet with no limits. So we believe that this species, despite being considered quite resilient in terms of its biology, it's really at risk of collapse without rapid in in intervention. But to set the scene and get everyone into the cuttlefish zone, um, I'd like to share with you a video that Blue has produced to shine a light on these amazing animals and the need for better management to safeguard cuttlefish and sustainable fisheries.
Wonderful, thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, just a shout out to my colleague, Freddie Watson, um, for putting that together and, and finding literally the most mesmerizing music to accompany it. It gives me cuddle bumps every time. Um, and you'll be able to enjoy that again at, at the end. It's also out on our um, Twitter feed at the moment. So you can enjoy that as many times as you like. Um, so on to the aims of the symposium and a future event that we plan to hold in, in the spring. So first and foremost, and the focus of this afternoon is that we want to share information on the current biology stock status research and management measures. And through this, we hope we can identify new or existing management measures that are working that could be applied more widely. We can identify gaps in data and research in support of potential management measures and hopefully identify areas for collaboration. And all of this, um, we hope well, can, we can co ultimately collectively input to the development of a fisheries management, management plan for cuttlefish. So to work towards that, we've got enough, a very full agenda this afternoon to bring together as much information as possible to inform the next steps. And we're very pleased and grateful to all of our speakers for making the time to input but as there is um, so much to cover, can I please ask that everyone tries to keep to time? We've also extended the end time to 5.30, which may differ from the time in your original invitation. Um, but presentations should have finished by five, and if anyone needs to leave early, and we'll be sharing the recording of the, of the whole afternoon in the next couple of weeks. So, Let's get started with our first speakers on biology and current research. Please do post your questions in the Q&A box during the presentations and we'll answer those at the end of the, of the four presentations. And first up, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chris Barrett, Senior Fisheries Advisor at CFAS, who will open with us with a presentation on cuttlefish biology and research. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, I hope everyone can see me and I hope everyone can see my presentation and hear my voice okay. Just to let you know I am feeling quite cold at the moment, a bit ropey, so I hope my voice is clear enough for you to understand what I'm trying to say. Um, so, hi everyone, I am Chris Barrett, I'm a senior fishery scientist working for CPAS, and my specialism is in shellfish, um, although particularly sort of keplopods and their fisheries. So, this afternoon's presentation touches a little bit on cuttlefish biology, as well as some of the research that we've been doing within CPAS. So firstly, cuttlefish is of the English Channel. There's three. There's the elegant cuttlefish, Sepia elegans, the pink cuttlefish, which I probably don't pronounce properly, uh, Sepia or Bigniana, correct me if I'm wrong. And then our beloved common cuttlefish, Sepia officinalis. Um, so the elegant cuttlefish is the smallest of the three, sort of to around 75 millimeters mantle length. And it's best distinguished by its tentacular club, which shown here is short and oval six to eight suckers in rows and three to four in large suckers in the middle and the cuttle bones are giveaway too it's sharp points on either end it's quite diamond shaped the pink cuttlefish is also small but it grows to around 120 millimeters mantle length and again the tentacular club is short and oval but this time there's five to six transverse rows and there's only three large suckers in the middle with one slightly smaller sucker on each side of those and here the cuttle bones more oblong, but it tends to be more red colored than in the common cuttlefish, although that isn't always a distinguishing feature. So for the common cuttlefish, they're the largest of the three, up to around 450 millimeters mantle length. And as you can see, the suckers on the tentacular club vary in size. So there's no obvious suckers which are bigger than the others, like in the other two species. And they're generalists, they eat anything alive, and they live for one to two years before dying once they've spawned. So they're mostly a semelparous animal, so death follows after a single mating cycle. And they release hundreds or thousands of eggs, like Sandra showed in the previous video. And they're found anywhere from the subtidal shallows down to about 200 meters depth, although they're usually more encountered within sort of 100 meters depth. And as we all know, this species is the more commonly encountered and the one most commonly landed by fishers. So why do we care so much about cuttlefish? We all know that they're fascinating animals just from their behavior and their ecology alone, but they're also a valuable fisheries resource, as Sam has already said. So this table shows the top 10 most valuable fisheries to England, landed by UK vessels in 2018. And I particularly went for this year just to remove any 
um, sort of influence of Brexit and COVID on the results. But as you can see, seven of the top 10 are shellfish. And the fifth most valuable fishery was for cuttlefish, worth 14.9 million. And if I remember rightly, this figure was almost quadruple the value of the fishery only a few years before. So it's a growing and it's a valuable fishery. Um, so in CPAS, we've been getting hold of samples from commercial catches on a monthly basis. And here we record mantle lengths, weights, sex and maturity. And as you can see here by the presence of the eggs, this was a mature female. And this type of data collection is something that we're now doing at sea on board CPAS's research vessel. Um, so if anyone's interested, there's now a very easy to use, publicly available Kefalopod ID guide by two CPAS staff, uh, Vlad Laptohovsky and Rosanna Owens which I'll be happy to circulate. So if that does interest you, please send me your email addresses or whatever else I can email those to you. Um, but perhaps one of the biggest projects that we've done in CFAS was the Western Channel work where biological data were obtained from Blim um, Plymouth and Brixham fish markets in 2018 and 2019. And I can't take credit for this one as Samantha Stott who's presenting next had the sort of lead in this work area. But in summary, the project investigated whether there were distinct combinations of time, space, and gear, which indicate targeting a cuttlefish, um, particularly juvenile cuttlefish, <clears throat> because as we'd all expect, capture of small, immature specimens in big numbers might have a negative impact on the stock's sustainability. Um, so the two biggest ports for cuttlefish landings are Brixham, contributing towards 57% of landings, and Plymouth, which was contributing towards 11% <clears throat> of landings. Brixham landings are mainly from beam trawls, and otter trawls are the main gear type into Plymouth. And these gear types as well represent 87% of total UK cuttlefish landings, so much more from the trawler cohorts than the traps. <clears throat> So between two, December 2018 and June 2019, we had weekly samples of cuttlefish landings in these two ports. Um, and the majority, again, came from the beam and the otter trawls. And the data revealed that all gears catch immature, which we defined as less than 16 centimeters mantle length, um, mature and pre-spawning individuals. Although the results from the static and dredge gears had to be taken with caution. There's sort of very few samples there. so these gear data might be unrepresentative. But when we reviewed these over the whole season, around 75% of the individuals landed, uh, landed by trawl gears were immature. But because these were small specimens as well, they only made up for around a quarter of the total tonnage landed. Then the otter trawls landing into Plymouth, they saw a particular concentration of immature individuals, Mice's rectangle 29E5. And in Brixham, landings from the otter trawls saw a particular concentration of small individuals from 30 E6. So then on a trip by trip basis for both Plymouth and Brixham, the catch composition from beam trawls tended to either be almost all, uh, almost all large or almost all small uh, with little evidence of an even mix. And this implies some sort of level of spatial separation between large and small cuttlefish, but given the spatial resolution for reporting the catches and the weekly sampling design, we can't really fully assess whether there's a specific targeting of size classes or whether the catch composition was just purely by chance. So moving forward, addressing the issue of targeting would really require a sampling programme which directly involves the fishers and collection of samples directly from hauls rather than just relying on the sampling of landed catches. So more recently, we're now investigating how best to determine the age of cuttlefish to help, well, to hopefully give us a sort of critical information on the understanding of the life histories and the population dynamics. So as you may know, an octopus speaks for a reliable tool for age determination, but that hasn't been validated in cuttlefish. And in squids, they have statoliths. So if you don't know, it's like the cephalopod equivalent of a fish otolith, like the little ear stones of a fish, which is similar to a tree and how you read the age. But again, these statuses haven't been validated in cuttlefish. And as we all know, cuttlefish have a cuttle bone. So we've been investigating the cuttle bone for the aging because they have these parallel streaks called lamellae, which hopefully you can see on the picture there of the cuttle bone. So we've been looking into whether these might be a reliable tool for age determination, although we do know that lamellae formation depends on the life stages of the cuttlefish and environmental factors like temperature. 
which is fine in captivity where you can maintain a constant temperature and you can assess the lamellae against counts of a known age like in hatchery reared specimens um, which is what most of the literature is published on at the moment these sort of hatchery reared ones in aquaria but in the wild caught fish that come from seas of varying temperatures it's very difficult to determine so so far it's a work in progress um, but having said that, if anyone else in the audience has done work on aging cuttlefish, fish, um, I'd love to hear from you. It'd be really good to hear your experience and sort of investigate how we can collaborate further on those. So thank you very much for that brief run through of the uh, cuttlefish biology and research. And when the Q&A comes around, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Chris. That was an excellent insight into some fascinating research, which I'm sure we'll all want to delve a little bit deeper into um, outside of the symposium. Next, I invite Samantha Stott of CFAS again um, to present on cuttlefish stock assessment. Over to you, Sam. Hello, everyone. So as, as you've said, I'm Samantha Stott and I'm a fisheries scientist. Um, I've worked also on a number of shellfish uh, species, including running the crab and lobster um, stock assessment. So just a bit of a background on CFAS, if any of you don't know. So we provide advice on the sustainable management of marine and freshwater resources. This can be usually done to DEFRA, but it can also be to other stakeholder bodies. So in terms of what are stock assessments, so it's the process of collecting, analysing and reporting um, on fish population information. So to determine the changes in the abundance of fishery stocks in response to fishing and to the extent of as possible to be able to predict these. So at the end of the day, what we aim to do is a tool to support fisheries management. So one of the objectives, so historically we've, de we've worked on the stock development um, and this is mainly meaning that we look at what has been done in the future, in the past, sorry, and we try and assess the health of the stock. And in that sense, we will know if it's overfished or not, and then you can try and um, stop that uh, happening again in the future. But some can be used for um, forecasts. And this depends on how much um, of the forecast catches will be on the new recruits. So what I mean by that is that for most, for a lot of species, um, the incoming recruitment is one of the most important things and you need to be able to estimate that and understand that to be able to know how much you can fish in the future. So in that sense, we mainly talk of uh, MSY reference points, and you may have heard that. So what that means is we're trying to maximise the catch and we're trying to make sure that that is sustained in the future. And it generally gives us a understanding of the health of the stock. So if it's below the MSY reference point, then you're not overfishing uh, the stock. And generally, we... So if you see on the right here, so as effort increases, then you increase your yield, but you'll get to a point where uh, it can't replenish itself and then your yield will decrease. And for cuttlefish species in particular, it is difficult to use this MSY concept because it's a highly variable species. And what I mean by that is that for an MSY, the concept is that there is a stock recruitment relationship but cuttlefish seem to be, have a variable recruitment, and this is highly variable each year. And it seems to be affected by environmental factors, which would suggest potentially there is no stock recruitment relationship. And in this case, we would not be able to use the MSY concept, but we'd have to have an alternative reference point for long-term sustainable management. And this could be an example, escapement strategies, which is used for no out, but there are many others. So here are the things that are important to consider for cuttlefish stock assessment. So as Chris has men mentioned, they only live for two years and they die after reproduction. And this, they've also got a very large interannual variability in the recruitment and strength. And it is thought that the recruitment drives a large proportion of the catch. So it is dependent on this large recruitment coming in 
for there to be a natural, um, for them to actually grow in population and be able to be fished. So what does this imply for a stock assessment? So you need a stock assessment that is able to deal with the spawning mortality, i.e. they die after reproduction. So you would need to be able to also have a quick turnaround between the sampling and the analysis to forecast next season's catch. What I mean by that is that you need to be able to have a very short period in time between producing the advice for the, in terms of fisheries management and when you're getting your, your data, such as recruitment and catch data. It's also important to have a stock assessment that is um, able to capture spawning mortality because most stock assessment assume that natural mortality is constant and that it's the fishing mortality that varies. If, if you don't have an accurate um, stock assessment, then it would be suggesting that there's a high mortality is due to fishing, which would probably not be the case, depending on the species. Another thing to consider is that they're highly migratory. So the cuttlefish spawn inshore, they'll then move offshore um, to deeper waters in the winter, then they'll go back inshore to feed, back offshore in the winter, and then back inshore to spawn and die. That is considering that they have a two-year lifestyle but some are considered to also have a one year life cycle, essentially um, dying off after one year. And so that means that you need to have a very good understanding of the migration patterns, and these need to be integrated into a stock assessment. This also may have implications in terms of stock boundaries, as you can, if you consider the channel, for example, they may um, move offshore into um, French waters, for example, and we don't know how many would be coming back into uh, British waters if you're going to do a management at UK level. And also it's in this important to understand the overlap of the fishery and the stock, especially if you're going to do future catch scenarios. Um, and this is important, obviously, for management. We need to understand how the fleet will respond to any management strategy put into place. And uh, as it's been previously said, different fleets target uh, cuttlefish at different times. Pots are suggested to capture them inshore and they um, capture mature individuals. And obviously, um, offshore are trawlers and they capture the whole length of um, distribution of, of cuttlefish. And also, it's important to understand that cuttlefish are also caught uh, as bycatch, so there may be considerations part of a mixed fisheries as well. So it's important to understand all of these. Um, components when you're building up a, uh, a stock assessment and interpreting the results. And what we're doing at the moment, we're developing a two-stage model um, and it's able to capture the dynamics of the cuttlefish. So it has um, a movement model integrated into it to capture that migration. It is based on observer pro on the observer program, so that is to collect the length of cuttlefish, and it's also bent on logbook data. Um, I can talk into more detail into this, but it's it's quite a complex, and we don't really have that much time. So, thank you very much, and happy to answer any questions um, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was really interesting. Um, and as you say, it's an, a sort of overview of the factors that need consideration in assessing cuttlefish stocks, which is no, no mean feat. Um, and so, yes, I think there'll be probably be quite a few questions about that later. Um, so now, next up, we have Gemma Cusson, who um, will share some of the great public engagement initiatives being run by the Cephalopod Citizen Science Project. Over to you, Gemma. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gemma Cosson and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Cephalopod Citizen Science Project. You probably guessed from our name, but we are a citizen science project focused on cephalopods and our aim is to understand more about wild cephalopods by utilising data gathered by the public. Our project is not for profit as we currently don't have any income and everything we do is run by volunteers. We gather observations of wild cephalopods across various social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and also via our website. 
We have lots of different observation groups on Facebook from different regions across the globe, which you can see here in this map. And we currently have 17 different ones. These Facebook groups were first established in 2017. Our biggest group is our UK group, which has almost 2000 members currently. The majority of these members are scuba divers, but we also have beachcombers, fishermen, and people that just have a general interest in cephalopods. People provide us with really interesting observations of cephalopods. You can see here on the slide, some examples of observations that were shared on our UK group. And we get observations of cephalopods that are dead or alive, whether they're still in the sea or if they're stranded. And we get a lot of cephalopod eggs as well. Our project does lots of different things, but one thing we have done is to create ID guides for cephalopods in the North Sea. We also have one for the Med. Um, this is to help people identify different cephalopod species in these regions. And within this, we have also incorporated a welfare guide for cephalopods. So you can see here on the slide, there's some images of cephalopods exhibiting different defensive behaviours. And we think it's really important for people to be aware of these behaviours so that they can try and interact responsibly with cephalopods. These guides have um, been translated into multiple languages as well. Another thing that we have done is that we've responded to mass strandings of castlefish eggs. And this happened over a few weeks this summer in the south coast of the UK. And people were finding that there was lots of cuttlefish eggs being washed up. Um, and some people in our group were trying to raise these themselves. So we decided to provide guidance based on the expertise of our researchers to improve their chances of success. A big part of our project is research. So far this year, we have published three peer reviewed papers, which you can see here on the slide. One of them was looking at identifying squid eggs for two different squid species, which were quite difficult to distinguish. This is a really important paper, especially for informing fisheries. Another paper we have published was looking at grouping behaviour in cuttlefish, and we found that um, there was large groups of cuttlefish off, off the coast of the UK, which has never been seen before. So that was really interesting. And we also published a paper looking at behaviours of the stout bobtail squid, for example, hunting, spawning and burying behaviours. And we've also got five more um, publications in preparation, which we're really excited about. Another big part of our project is public education, and we try and do as many public talks and educational outreach as possible, and of course, when possible. Thanks. Um, what have we learned so far about cuttlefish conservation through our project? We've actually seen that there's been decreased reports of um, adult cuttlefish in the breeding win windows over the past 40 years. That's based on reports by scuba divers. But we have got a lot of unpublished breeding data for cuttlefish, which we actually need a bit of help analysing. What we have seen is that the public are really keen to get engaged with cuttlefish conservation, and this is really encouraging. So, for example, artificial breeding sites were established to try and encourage cuttlefish to lay their eggs on, on these wooden structures. And these were installed by a Dutch scuba group, but we also have similar things happening in the UK waters. What's really positive is that completely normal egg development has been seen on them. And another added bonus is that other species use these sites, for example, endangered seahorses. Something that we are seeing is that there may be a change in the breeding windows of castlefish. We've currently got a, prep, a publication in prep, in prep, but just to discuss it briefly today, the graph on the left of the slide, the top one, you can see the frequency of juvenile cuttlefish and sexually mature cuttlefish from January to December. And the graph below shows the mean length of individuals from January to December. 
And what we can see is that there is a peak in the spring of large sexually mature individuals, which is what we would expect as this is their normal breeding season. But we're also seeing from the data that there is another peak in the autumn of large sexually mature cuttlefish. So we think that there may be a second breeding window opening uh, off the UK and Dutch coasts. And if this is the case, then of course, it's really important for informing conservation and fisheries. What can our project do going forward to help cuttlefish? We can continue to publish cuttlefish life history data. As I say, we have got publications currently in preparation. We could also help to conduct human behavior change research. Some of our researchers have got experience doing similar surveys. We could also help to monitor the longer term conservation efforts for cuttlefish by working alongside the scuba community. And we would also be happy to work as a mediator between various stakeholders. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your time. I put a link to our website and you can follow us on socials if you would like to check out more of our projects. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, um, Gemma, that was excellent. It was a real um, example of the value and impact of, of citizen science. Um, finally, for this session, we've got a wonderful hot from the editing suite film um, about cuttlefish produced by Rosalie, Rosie Ashley East, um, who I'll just hand over to now to introduce you to the video. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Rosie. Um, I'm based in, well, I was based in Dorset. I'm now based in Bristol and I'm a wildlife filmmaker, um, and I've got family who live in the lovely fishing town of Murderford in Dorset. So I've just made a film as part of my masters um, about cuttlefish fisheries and their conservation. And it explores the themes of how both fisheries and actually conservation efforts can't be mutually exclusive. Um, it's been really, really fascinating. I'm, I love cuttlefish. I'm even more in love with them than I was before. So. Yeah, let's have a look, shall we? <laughs> Nestled in the heart of Dorset's stunning coastline lies my hometown, the small fishing port of Mudderford Quay. Local fishermen go to sea from the quay to catch cuttlefish and every spring pull in fishing pots laden with cuttlefish eggs. I'm absolutely fascinated by cuttlefish. They're such alien, complex creatures and amaze me with their astounding abilities to change colour and camouflage. Every season, thousands of cuttlefish eggs are washed away by some fishermen. I want to show that a simple change could prevent this terrible waste and help more eggs to survive. It's a change that can help conserve both cuttlefish and the fishing heritage of Mudderford. On an early morning in May, I go to sea with two local Mudderford fishermen, Pete Dads and Richard Stride, to see how they fish for cuttlefish and ensure the eggs on their pots survive over the fishing season. Hey, these, no problem at all. But little spider, <laughs> that's it, gone. I haven't always been fishing for cuttlefish. Um, I only started back in about the mid-90s um, because Basically, a chap called Richard Stride got me into it. And at that time, I think Richard only had about 30 pots out. And I thought, well, what a lovely way to earn a living. Well, I stumbled upon them quite by accident, actually. I'd, I'd made a trap for fish. And uh, using that experimentally, I discovered that it was catching cuttlefish. It just happened to be the spring and cuttlefish season. And at the time, I didn't have a market for those cuttlefish, so I left them in the trap and um, a couple of days later the trap was absolutely full. Richard realised that his pots were always covered in tiny cuttlefish eggs and I can see that every pot hauled in is laden with them. 
just as generations of Mudderford fishermen have done. Richard and Pete put their pots back, unbaited, leaving the eggs undisturbed to hatch. Because the traps are there, they, they've found something to lay eggs on. And in parts of uh, Sussex, divers found that there were n they didn't find any eggs on the natural substrate at all. They were all on, on the traps. What we're doing is, is a, it's quite a highly technical thing, really. I mean, people don't appreciate it, how much you need to try to understand uh, the fish that you catch in order to, to catch them. And cuttlefish are no, ex no exception. The future of these cuttlefish and the subsequent impact on the fishing community of Mudderford is important to me. Mudderford is my hometown and I've both lived and worked on the quay, fishing in the summer with my family in between shifts as crew on the local ferry. Both the fishing community and the cuttlefish rely on each other to survive, so I want to show how a simple sustainable change in fishing methods could allow thousands more cuttlefish to hatch per season and preserve Mudderford's fishing heritage for years to come. So if there was one fishery I could do it, and bin all the others, it would be this. It's lovely. To demonstrate how leaving egg-laden pots at sea helps eggs to survive, I decided to take some eggs which had fallen off the pots during fishing and hatch them myself so I can better understand the cuttlefish life cycle and see how sustainable fishing like this can give the cuttlefish a real chance of survival. Back home, I introduced the cuttle eggs into their new tank and I contacted Dr Gavin Cook, cuttlefish expert and founder of the Keflopod Citizen Science Project, to help me learn about these amazing creatures. The females will wrap the egg um, in an ink layer, um, but when it comes to the end of her reproductive cycle, the one time she breathes before she dies, she might literally run out of ink like a printer. And you will find these eggs which are translucent looking, they look white from a little bit of a distance, but when you look closely, you can actually see these little embryos getting bigger and bigger as the weeks go on. What really captures my imagination about cuttlefish is that they're different even for cephalopods. And everyone knows cephalopods are different and weird and unusual, but within that weird world, the cuttlefish are weirder still in many ways. As we watch the eggs develop over time, the tiny cuttlefish embryos develop three hearts, blue blood, eight arms and two tentacles. They also begin to sense the world around them, learning about prey and predators by looking through the egg membrane. In other words, they're watching me. Witnessing the eggs develop is absolutely incredible and it's amazing to think that this would be happening on the fishermen's cuttlefish pots in Mudderford. If the eggs are given a chance and aren't washed off at sea or left to dry on shore, thousands more baby cuttlefish will survive and provide more animals for future generations, helping the fishermen too. Richard works both as a fisherman and for the Southern Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority, based across Dorset and the southwest. It's a very interesting fishery. It's the cleanest, cleanest fishery that I've come across. When I say clean, it's um, obviously there's a lot of ink involved, <laughs> so not clean from that point of view, but w what we call a clean fishery is one which doesn't have um, a large bycatch uh, or, or harm any, anything else in the process, basically. With Richard and Pete working to be as clean as possible, Gavin knows exactly what more fishermen need to do to ensure more eggs survive. If I was going to advise fishermen what to do, my single suggestion would be to return the, the pots or the traps as they found them, um, remove the animals um, that they need for sale because those animals have laid their eggs, they've done what they need for the next generation. But what we really need and what I would desperately love all fishermen to do is just to leave the pots or put the pots back for the two, three months during the egg development and then they can bring them up again. By leaving the eggs on the pots, the fishermen allow them to naturally develop and become carriers for other marine species like anemones and coral. It takes about 40 days for the cuttles to develop and by July I can see the embryos are becoming restless.
Hatching out from the egg at the size of my pinky fingernail, I watch the tiny cuttlefish explore their new home. Cuttlefish are direct developers, so Hatch Out is a miniature adult, able to change colour and texture in the blink of an eye. This is a crucial adaptation for newborn cuttlefish, as it allows them to camouflage from predators and stalk their prey. When camouflaging against the sandy stones, I can see the tiny chromatophores in the cuttlefish's skin rippling with colour. These sacs are filled with sepia ink and expand and contract to change the colour of their skin to allow them to hide in their natural habitat. In the wild, the baby cuttlefish are so small that some seaweed and algae would be about 10 times their size. If they can survive the harsh tidal conditions and escape predation, they can grow to over a foot long over the next two years. But in order to do that, they need to hunt. Never underestimate the hatchlings. They're ferocious predators from the minute they're born. Blink and you'll miss it. Once prey is sensed, cuttlefish shoot out their front extendable tentacles, snaring prey into a hidden razor-sharp beak. Babies are born with clever innate skills for hunting. This one is mimicking swaying seaweed to get close to its prey. With a belly full of shrimp, the cuttles are finally satisfied. Seeing the character and the extraordinary development of my cuttlefish puts the reality of fishing into perspective. While it's good to see responsible fishermen like Richard and Pete making a real effort to conserve the eggs, I worry that there are still thousands of eggs needlessly destroyed. Not to mention the clearly unsustainable mass trawling of juvenile cuttlefish before they even have a chance to breed. Well, we've been telling them for years that there needs to be some sort of uh, quota or well, yes. um, restrictions put in place for them, but... They seem um, very slow in bringing in uh, restrictions or protections for fish, but they seem very fast in bringing in restrictions on fishermen. Yeah, it's a bit random, to be honest. So, to see the real impact that leaving pots at sea has had on the Mudderford cuttlefish population, I go to sea with Richard and Pete to pull in their cuttle pots for the end of the season and release my baby cuttlefish back into the wild. These are the empty egg husks. So the little, the little cuttlefish have hatched and swum away, and that's what's left. I'll probably, I'll probably go as far as to say there'll probably be a thousand on each trap. I wouldn't be surprised. Some of them get absolutely caked in them. Every single empty egg on the pots is another cuttlefish that survived egg development, and it's heartwarming to see the hundreds of empty eggs that have hatched like mine. It's good. I think if you if you didn't do what we do, I think you just cut your own throat for the next season. I mean, we we pushed for the fisheries to bring a bylaw in because we knew the fishermen, especially up the other end of the bay, were uh, they were bringing their traps in and uh, pressure washing them off. But obviously, if an egg is not attached to something solid, then um, it doesn't, it's, it's chances of survival are very, very slim, I think about 10%. Whereas if they're attached to something, then the chances are they will make it all the way. So the best place for them is on the traps themselves. I mean, they're a very charismatic species, there's no doubt about it. And some people would say, well, if, you're, you, know, if you find them that interesting, why kill them and sell them for profit? Well, I, I, I suppose we, we, we are fishermen, we, we extract species from the sea to sell, so, but it doesn't stop us from appreciating them as, as creatures as well, and the cuttlefish is very charismatic. 
as sustainable as Muddiford fishing practices are, the future of the cuttlefish fishery is still uncertain for Richard and Pete. Well, recently we've been always feeling a, bit, a little bit um, a bit concerned about whether we're going to be able to rely on the cuttlefish at all because of the the um, the impact of the the trawl fishery down in the southwest. But it was at one time. I mean, it is my favourite fishery. So yes, I look forward to it. Probably about the fifth generation of my family that we know has been uh, fishing. Probably the last as well. Sadly, uh, well, none of my um, none of my children are interested in uh, fishing as a career. They've all come out and done a bit, um, but they've not. You know, they've all decided it's not for them. So who can blame them? Really? Although the future of the fishery and the cuttlefish hangs in a balance of conservation and sustainable exploitation, it's rewarding to see local fishermen doing all they can to look after their cuttlefish. I hope all fishermen will take care of their cuttlefish eggs in the future to preserve both this wonderful species and the fishing heritage of Muddiford for years to come. Thank you so much, Rosie. That was absolutely awesome. I'm sure that um, there's plenty of comments in the, coming in through, through the chat and the Q&A just saying just how brilliant that film is and well done. It's a wonderful example of, of positive working as well between fishermen, science and, and media as well. So I, I think we'll be seeing a lot more of that film. Thank you again. That was, that was absolutely brilliant. I think everyone's still got that image of that hatchling coming out imprinted on their brains. So... Um, that comes to the end of our first session, but we've now got a time for a couple of minutes for Q&A. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jacob, who's going to take us through and, uh, and read out some of the questions um, to pose to the panellists. Over to you, Jacob. Thank you so much, Sam. So I'm Jacob. I'm from Mindfully Wired Communications. Um, thanks so much to all our presenters um, and to that um, beautiful, entrancing film at the end. So I'm now going over to the Q&A box. Our first question is from Michael Cooper. Um, so if our speakers from that section could just pop on their cameras. Um, Michael Cooper asks, based on the amount of eggs that cuttlefish can produce, would it be feasible to follow a similar model used by Padstow's National Lobster Hatchery to support the recovery of cuttlefish stocks? Um, so this is an open question to any of our speakers from the first session that would like to come in on it. Chris? Oh, it's me. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. It's something that I very briefly go over in this, after, well, another presentation I'm giving later on, um, where they have tried this kind of work before in Japan, where they've tried restocking cuttlefish. So they've reared cuttlefish in captivity, released juveniles back into the wild. Uh, but it's a little bit inconclusive because they did try tagging these animals to then see how many they get back, see how many survive. But they had something like 0.02 to 0.04% back. So it was really hard to work out if these juveniles did survive well in the wild. Uh, certainly the eggs might survive better, but once from the wild again, it's really hard to understand what difference it's made to the wild stocks. Um, so in Japan, they ultimately said it was not an economically viable uh, piece of work to carry on, but whether there could be improvements made or whether it would work somewhere else. Um, perhaps it could be feasible. Um, so I do touch on that a little bit later on, um, but at the moment it's hard to tell. I don't know what other people's opinions are there. Thank you, Chris. Um, Gemma, is that any ever anything that comes up with regards to your citizen scientists who do it for free? So I guess the economic viability doesn't come into that. Um, how have you found that experience? Um, I guess that doesn't really come up so much. I mean, we, we get so many different observations put in that we could look into that sort of thing, but we haven't, we haven't really so far. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, anyone else want to come in on that before we move on? Okay, we've then got a question for Gemma. Um, so going back to your presentation, have you come across any clues as to what might be causing the changes in breeding patterns that you've seen? 
Um, well, thank you so much for your question. I know that is a really interesting um, bit of research. I personally haven't been involved in that in that paper, so I don't know for sure the answer to your question. But I mean, it could be something to do with climate change and how how that's changing um, environmental factors. But it also could be just down to the life cycle of cuttlefish. But again, I I can't say for sure as I'm not personally involved in that research. For sure, thank you. Um, is that something either of our CFAS speakers have any insights into perhaps? I think at the moment it's quite early on to say, I mean, I don't know if someone in the audience like John Paul Raban would have any thoughts from the French side. Um, but like Gemma's already said, it could be a mixture of climate change, the impacts on sort of population dynamics, and then things like years when they see massive landings into Brixham by various cohorts of the fisheries. Um, it just seems a little bit early to tell at the moment, but hopefully the more data we collect, the more sort of confident we can be with what we're assuming. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving on, there's a question for Sam here from Richard Stride, who asks, would the catch data from the inshore trap fishery be more useful for forecasting future stocks since the cuttlefish being caught are those that have survived to reproduce? Yes, yeah, so that is an interesting question. So in terms of forecasting um, ability, it is thought that there's no relationship between the adult biomass and the recruitment. I, it's not because there's let's say, more adults in the population, that there's necessarily going to be a lot more recruits. Um, so an aspect that we're wanting to try is a uh, survey of newly recruits. So being able to capture that um, would give you kind of a recruitment index, and then that can feed into, um, into the stock assessment, and that can give you an idea of how, how much recruitment is going to go into the fishery um, the following year. In terms of being able to use uh, pot data, that is uh, something that we really need um, because, as I've said, we're using um, Observer Program for our length data. And the Observer Program doesn't capture pots, so we do need to get some length measurements from pots for sure um, because, as you say, those are the big mature ones um, that are, are going to spawn. So that's one aspect that we really do need to try and um, um, into well, integrating our assessments and data gather collection. Sure. Okay, great, thank you. I wonder- If, um, if I can add a comment. Jean-Paul, please, yes, go for it. Oh, thank you. Um, we've had um, uh, sampling carried out uh, in the Western coast of Normandy, uh, between Normandy and the British Isles, and uh, uh, comparing uh, the uh, catch by uh, trap fishing and uh, inshore trawlers. And uh, what was shown was that uh, um, the selectivity of trap fishing is much higher. Uh, in, in other words, they only get catch two year old uh, specimen uh, in spring, whereas um, the, the um, inshore trawlers uh, catch both cohorts, the, the one year old and, and the, the two year old specimen. So it's uh, it, it's more uh, mixed in in the inshore in the inshore trawlers. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, based on what you mentioned about pots, Sam, um, I wonder, Rosie, did any of the fishermen that you worked with um, show any sort of interest in getting involved in scientific data collection? Hi. Um, yeah, I think. Fishermen in general are actually really interested in their catch. Um, they want to learn as much as possible. Um, I know one of the fishermen I filmed, Richard, he's in the audience, so big thank you to him. Um, and Richard, obviously, he does so much work with all of the quota management and the and researching into the fisheries. So I think it's definitely something that they're interested in. And getting, you know, going out on a boat with the fishermen is the best way to learn about it. So I think it's definitely something that should be included in the future. Great, thank you very much. Um, anything else on that point before we move on? Okay, there's then a question from Gus Kaslake um, of Seafish, who asks, has any work been done on the spatial extent of cuttlefish in UK waters? Has it increased 
he mentions they've certainly seen uh, cuttlefish west of the Lizard Peninsula that they never used to see. Um, is this anything that perhaps CFAS have touched on? Any of our speakers feel free to come in. Hi, Sam. Uh, no, I mean, to my knowledge, no, we're still yet um, to, to see the extent of it. I mean, we can get the extent of the fishery, but that is different to the extent biological stock um, that it is. Um, so we don't really know to what it extends. I mean, Chris did show some, some maps to where, but I don't know, we don't have any more up to date than that, to my knowledge. If you don't mind, uh, the main extent that has been observed is uh, using survey data in the North Sea. And uh, these data, um, yeah, which is uh, uh, collected and has been analyzed by Daniel Osterwind uh, from Germany, uh, they, they have uh, good information about the change in cephalopod, all cephalopod species distribution in, in the North Sea. Um, as far as management is concerned, or as stock assessments, uh, we tend to consider that uh, um, the cuttlefish that are caught uh, in the southern part of the North Sea are just uh, uh, a part of the English Channel stock. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jean-Paul. Um, I think that's just about all we've got uh, time for in this session, but any of those questions that are left in the Q&A box, um, any of our speakers do feel free to type answers to them. Um, and if there's any that we come back to in Q&As further down the line, we can definitely do that too. Um, so I'll now hand back over to Sam, who will introduce our next session. Great, thank you everybody. It's some brilliant presentations to get us going and, and great questions too. So um, we're now going to move on to the session on the fishery, learn a bit more about the, the status and trends in the cuttlefish fishery. And um, to walk us through that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Morven Robertson, our, uh, which is Blue's Senior UK Marine Projects Manager. Over to you, Morven. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, hello, everyone. Absolutely delighted to be with you all today, learning so much about cuttlefish. Thank you to all the speakers for their participation so far. We're now moving into session two, focusing on the cuttlefish fishery. First, we will hear from Rachel Irish, Principal Marine Officer at the Marine Management Organisation, who will present the status of the fishery. Over to you, Rachel. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so yeah, I work um, for the MMO covering Devon, Dorset and Hampshire, part of Hampshire. I'm getting lots of questions coming up, sorry, from the thing, um, including the Port of Brixham. So um, most of you are familiar with the MMO, but just briefly, we're a manager, an independent regulator covering England's seas and have a wide remit, which includes fisheries management. Um, just to clarify as well, we cover from the shore out to the median line of the 200 mile limit, so we work quite closely with the IFCAs on the inshore. Um, and today's data um, is being presented is from sales note data of UK landings. Uh, that's from UK and foreign vessels that land into UK ports only, so it doesn't include foreign landings. Uh, the data is limited in terms of interpretation, as you'll probably see, but hopefully it supports um, the other presentations that have gone on today and um, the information from today, which has actually been absolutely fascinating. So um, uh, I'll start and on to the next slide, please. Uh, so um, this first slide shows landings by year and month. Um, you can see clearly the um, top part of the graph that is reached is 2017. And that had the peak in landings at 7,000 tonnes that year. Since then, the catch levels have generally reduced. Uh, that data is up to date from um, as of the 11th of November. Uh, so it shows quite a significant reduction in the catch in 2021. Uh, it looks like it's going to remain under 2,000 tonnes for the year. Um, just to briefly mention as well that the 2020 and 2021 data might have been reduced somewhat due to COVID as well. Um, the graph also shows in some years the fishery can be targeted 
in quantity in September, such as in 2017. But this isn't always the case, as you can see from the other months, so there's the natural variation you'd expect. Uh, the next slide shows monthly landings across that whole six year data set from 2015, um, showing that on average, the landings peak in September to January. Uh, I think not different for what we knew in terms of the bulk of the catches. If I can move on to a little bit of information on values, um, this shows the sales value of Cuttle, which built up to a high in 2017 of 25 million pounds. Uh, that's gradually reduced to what looks like it's not going to breach the 5 million mark this year. Um, this shows the price per tonne. Um, and just to sort of, I mean, that's per tonne, but just to put it into a bit of a clearer context, really, um, it shows that prices uh, have ranged this year from about two to three pounds per kilo. In 2017, the prices started above that at 3.29 per kilo and rose actually to £4.10 per kilo. So, um, yeah. Okay, the next slide then shows those two last slides together. So it's the quantity and value together. So you could see, you might discern from that, that there's a factor in the targeting of the stock related to the price. I hope I'm not going through these too quickly for you. Um, so the next slide is about where it's caught. And as you can see from our data, um, it's very much a 7E stock and relatively low levels caught in both um, D and H. This is looking at 2019 data as an example, which is pre-COVID, hopefully a little bit more reliable in general. Um, you can see across the ports that Brixham is the main port of landing in terms of the quantities, uh, with a little bit land being landed at Plymouth and Newlyn as well. But clearly it's the major port in the southwest. Just to make the point again that this doesn't include foreign vessel landings data. Uh, so this is Cuttle landed into UK ports. Uh, and you can see that it's predominantly UK vessels for those landings that are targeting the stock. Just focusing again on 2019 data, we can see when looking at landings by size of vessel and gear type that this is an over 10 fishery on the right of the graph. Uh, the beam trawlers being the main prosecutors of the fishery. Uh, catching over twice that of the demersal trawls in quantity. Uh, just to mention that, you know, to my knowledge, uh, in the life of the fishery at Brixham, um, the, this has relieved the pressure off the sole quotas, uh, and Brixham has traditionally been a sole port with sole as its main target species due to its price. So, um, and sole has in the last few years seen an increase in the available quota. So that also might be another factor in why the landings are lower now, but our data obviously doesn't tell you any more than that. Uh, lastly, uh, just looking at the gears in a little bit more detail by month, you can see there's a small trap fishery around April to May. The demersal fleet, which operate closer in shore, have landed similar quantities in October to the beam trawl fleet, but from November onwards, the beamers are better able to target the stock further offshore. And really, that's it for me. I just wanted to thank Ed Baker for putting those slides together for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was really interesting to hear the perspective from the MMO. And I'm sure people will have lots of questions about management and when it comes to the MMO later in the session. I'm now really pleased to introduce Robert Wakeford, the Managing Director of MRAG, who will present some of the key trends in the fishery. We were really fortunate to work with MRAG a few years ago to undertake a review of cuttlefish, and that's really laid the foundation for our work today and the symposium we're having. So um, over to you, Rob. Great. Thanks very much. Um, 
Morven, and uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to present some of the, the work that we've recently been doing. Um, so as has been said, my name is Robert Wakeford. I am currently Managing Director at uh, MRAG. We're a private consultancy company based here in the UK. And what I'm planning to do today is present the results of some of the work that we did back in 2018. Um, and perhaps providing where possible sort of an update um, from that report as well. Um, I have to also indicate that I wasn't one of the main authors of that report and I'm very grateful for those. I think a couple of those are, are in the audience today. So Rebecca Mitchell and also Chloe North. So they are, were um, the key authors of, of this work. Um, I've been involved in sort of cephalopods for a number of years. And in fact, I was uh, part of the Falklands uh, group at Imperial College where we conducted sort of management and stock assessment of the, the cephalopod fisheries in, in and around the Falkland Islands. So I'm familiar with some of the, the management of the ilex and the, the lolliginids uh, fisheries as well, the inshore. So the cuttlefish um, is a very, very interesting fishery to me, uh, UK based obviously as a non-quota species. So there's a lot of similarities between some of the work that I've been doing and I'm hopefully going to be able to show you uh, some of these trends which will complement some of the the work that Rachel has produced as well uh, and to provide some more of a, a historical perspective. So um, perhaps we just take a, a, an overview of sort of where where we've come from and perhaps gives an indication of where we're going. Um, European landings here from both the UK and European uh, side of things from ICES data, uh, we've got that going back to 1970. Uh, you can see that the fishery has really only just start, um, been exploited sort of in the last couple of decades. Um, although there were some anecdotal evidence that uh, some of the large catches were taken uh, within the region, but they were discarded uh, when they had been captured because there was no market for them. And it's really sort of since 2000, I think, that there's been a growth in the market, uh, which has sort of driven sort of the the, the interest in retaining cuttlefish. As you can see, sort of up um, when it started really from 2000 to about 2010, that was the development of the fishery uh, where sort of catches really did start to increase. And as been mentioned by Rachel, this is predominantly um, a fishery from the English Channel um, and certainly sort of in the Western uh, Channel waters as well as sort of where things are predominant um, at this time. So uh, we saw um, in Rachel's slide sort of an indication of which of the, the, um, the largest catching nations. And this kind of gets a little bit more of a historical perspective as well. Um, but as you can see, France has been one of the key players as well as the UK and Spain. Um, and generally there has been sort of a fluctuation in landings, which is also shown in the previous slide, but this broken down by different sort of member states um, and and uh, England, um, Wales and Northern Ireland, you can see that um, there has been generally uh, a slight decline in the last few years um, when you're looking at the overall pattern. But, but overall, um, there's been sort of quite a consistent pattern of, of exploitation during this time. Um, and sort of the UK catches at the moment sort of tend to fluctuate around sort of uh, two to 7,000 tonnes at the moment. Um, again, uh, perhaps extending on some of the work that Rachel presented earlier, um, this is some total value of the cuttlefish from UK vessels only. And um, during the development of the fishery, really from about sort of 2000, really taking off now in 2008, you can see a steady growth in the value of the cuttlefish, which was due to the to primarily some of the landings, um, which tended to peak in 2017. So when we actually produced this report back in 2018 initially, um, it tended to suggest then that the fishery was going from strength to strength. Um, but adding the latest data, you can start to see that there has been a decline since that peak in 2017. So it's interesting to see sort of why this might be. Um, obviously, prices have uh, played a, a very big part, but also sort of um, when we talk about management side of things, um, when we're talking, uh, looking at perhaps the sole fishery and other opportunities that have now presented themselves sort of politically as well as within the fishery, I think that's going to provide some useful discussion. But certainly, you know, it's peaked in 2017. That seemed to be uh, sort of the hot spot in this time. And it's really sort of um, like being able to pave the way of, of where the fishery is going in future. 
Um, and it's important when we're looking at this data to sort of see what the status of the, the stocks are as well. So we have to sort of uncouple what's happening from the landings to actually what's the, the status of the fishery. So even though you might be able to see that um, there's perhaps been a decline in the landings and, and therefore the value, that doesn't necessarily mean to say that there's been a direct causal link with the, the population status. Um, can do, but not necessarily always directly because there can be market uh, drivers as well. Okay, um, so perhaps going on to a little bit more detail here, uh, data from 2008 to 2017. Again, we sort of just able to, to show quite clearly here through the landings data uh, in different Ithaca districts, sort of where, where the predominance of catches uh, are found. And, and it really just goes to support one of the previous slide I just made that it's a, it's a southern uh, fishery, uh, particularly within the English Channel and um, uh, um, uh, the, the sort of southern region. So, you know, there's the Devon and Southern Ifka is, is by far the greatest and always has been sort of the dominant um, region uh, with the Cornish Ifka as well, sort of the second um, most important region. Um, and I'll show in a short while sort of some of the distribution of catches in those areas. But perhaps um, might be interesting sort of adding latest data to this to see whether cuttlefish are beginning to move further north in their distributions and that will have very important implications for stock assessment and management um, but obviously at this time the uh, the southern region becomes remains the, the dominant sort of markets um, and fisheries for this particular species. So here it is in some numbers. I'm afraid uh, I haven't got many pretty slides with, with uh, lovely pictures of, of cuttlefish. Um, so here's some numbers for you to be able to put this into context. It also perhaps demonstrates that Brixham is the dominant. It always has been data uh, from 2014 up to uh, 2020. This has um, been supplemented from recent information from the Blue Marine Foundation. So I'm grateful for them to, to provide this information. And you can see that um, Devon and Seven Ifka really is sort of still plays a significant role in this fishery and despite sort of the challenges both with sort of the UK exit and also COVID um, they've continued to, to you know um, land a, a significant proportion of the catch over the last few years. Um, second to them is sort of in Plymouth um, part of again the Devon Seven uh, IFCA uh, has maintained sort of second place uh, in the level of importance. Um, but it's not to say that other places along the south coast play, don't play an important part. Uh, and in fact, also for different gear types, um, they, they might also be very important for sort of the local communities as well. So, um, you know, Brixham and, and the Plymouth are certainly the, the key areas and continue to do so. And I think what was interesting sort of takeaway from this is that um, some of the challenges that we've had over the last couple of years doesn't necessarily seem to have had um, such a, a big impact as you would expect. It hasn't sort of closed the fishery, which would then have impacts for the status of the stock. So uh, the level of fishing effort or the mortality on the, on the cuttlefish um, may not have been significantly reduced during this time. Um, so it might be interesting to sort of find out what the implications of that might have been. So here's a little bit of a, a sort of a snapshot, um, historical trends. Again, it's only up to 2017. So um, we're aware that things probably have declined since 2017, having shown my previous slide up to more recent data. Um, but it's really just showing from the auction site here that cuttlefish was one of the most valuable species uh, being sold at the time. Um, although, as Rachel said, sole was being very, very important. Um, and perhaps now it'd be interesting to see whether that's now uh, that dynamic that is beginning to switch. So we're going to see perhaps a decline in the cuttlefish and an increase in the sole. Um, so that would perhaps, uh, does that sort of affect the targeting behavior of some of the fleets um, and therefore sort of where they go fishing and therefore the impact on these stocks as well, particularly, um, you know, with the conservation status uh, of, of, the, um, of the sole. So, uh, this is something that I think is very interesting to show the sudden increase, um, but you know that's primarily due to sort of the uh, the landings at the time, um, and some of the price information we think uh, might be also because there was a collapse of the, the squid fisheries in the Indian Ocean around 2017, which also helped potentially to drive up the market price in 2017. So 
subsequent to that, um, you know, some of the markets might have been more depressed um, and sort of returning some of the values uh, to, to sort of more historical norms. But again, that's something that um, others sort of in the audience today will probably have uh, more information about and probably useful to have a discussion. So uh, just a little bit of a breakdown we saw earlier about the distribution of the fleets. Um, Rachel sort of showed that uh, we've got on the over, over tens uh, was mainly made up of the trawl fleet, sort of the beam trawls, um, and the under tens here uh, make up sort of a relatively smaller percentage, but nevertheless important um, element of the fishery. And they sort of, uh, they seem to be a sort of relatively constant proportion uh, throughout the years. So those things haven't necessarily changed. You haven't seen a vast increase in either of the different types of vessels within the statistics. Um, although their targeting and the sort of type of catches may have changed. Um, the total landings here uh, do show also some sort of interesting patterns where you might start to see there's one good year and then one bad year or less, less good year. Um, so it's sort of an alternating high, low, high, low pattern. And that might be to do with sort of the life cycle of cuttlefish and that they sort of have between one and two years. So we're perhaps looking here at sort of potentially good fishing years uh, related to their life cycle. So um, perhaps then going into a little bit more detail, um, looking back at sort of the, the total reported landings by these different gear types. So the beam trawl you can see clearly here has been the dominant gear type uh, with the otters as well. So those sort of big um, over 10 vessels, over 10 meter vessels, uh, still retain a large proportion of the, the catches um, and are predominant in the fleet as well. But um, there has also been some um, uh, a generally sort of uh, continuous increase in, in the volume of landings from both the nets and the traps as well. So it's not necessarily as if we've seen a, a sudden increase in one gear type over another. Uh, they seem to just follow the natural sort of variation of um, perhaps the population in itself um, as it sort of increases and decreases according to sort of environmental uh, conditions, allowing sort of increases in abundance uh, over sort of the, um, the period seen here. Um, so uh, this is a snapshot really just looking at the beam trawls um, sort of over sort of the period 2008 to 13. And this really helps to just to demonstrate again that uh, you know the large beam trawls sort of target further offshore the uh, winter and autumn fishery. And certainly sort of the, the peak catches occur sort of around January and February time. Um, and the as the, the movement of the the cuttlefish start to move uh, inshore for, for the spawning and so forth, they become less available. And so this data is clearly able to demonstrate that sort of pattern, which is rather nice. In uh, next slide. Yeah, thank you. You can start to see sort of the, the spatial distribution of these uh, catches as well. So this is just a snapshot for 2017, um, but the data could be extended for other years as well. But what you can see here is um, very clearly sort of the, the, the sort of the, the hot spots really of where the, the fishing activities occur for both the beam trawl and the otter trawl. And these seem to occur sort of um, in and around Brixham, which is obviously where the largest um, landings and the markets are for, for, for these gear types as well. Um, so obviously this remains a very key area, but um, it's also sort of extends out to quite a, a large geographic area as well. Um, and it plays an important part in sort of the, the population abundance, sort of the targeting of larger individuals, um, but sort of in the inshore region, there might be for some of the smaller uh, beam trawlers, sort of what the interactions would be for um, some of the size classes of, of cuttlefish and whether they're actually retaining small juveniles or whether they're all um, large um, mature animals. So I think that's a really key point as well. So what, what do these gears sort of um, uh, retain and, and when? I think that's something that we need to also sort of look at more carefully when we're thinking about management. So moving on then perhaps to um, the, the smaller sort of um, under 10 fleet uh, that's used mostly sort of the pots and traps. 
uh, you can see these take advantage. These of um, in the early spring uh, and summer fishery, uh, they fish more inshore where the, they have access to the, um, the, the cuttlefish sort of after or coming into the spawning period. Um, and you can see it's quite a short season uh, where they're able to take advantage of that. Um, sort of around May is, is really the peak time when these uh, the catches are, are most abundant. And here's just a few more sort of plots to show the, show the spatial distribution of, of the catches uh, by these rectangles, uh, ICs rectangles in, in 2017. The, uh, the pots and traps, uh, there didn't seem to be many hotspots, but there might be localized um, areas where you do get good catches. But generally, uh, in comparison to some of the large volumes of catches that we get from the trawlers, um, you can see it's somewhat ubiquitous uh, along the, the southern coast. Um, perhaps the only point of note in, in 2017 was the trammel nets. Um, and in and around Shoreham, uh, they seem to be sort of a hotspot of the use of that gear. Um, so it's no surprise that actually that's where the majority of those catches are occurring. Um, but uh, overall, this is a snapshot from 2017, and it'll be used to be able to see sort of how the, the spatial distribution of the fishery has changed over time. And I think that was one of the questions that we had uh, from the audience um, earlier today was, you know, are we seeing a, um, changes in, in the distribution of or the location of catches? So is, is the population growing or is it shrinking? Or, and also when we're thinking about climate change, you know, is there pattern of uh, movement and catches uh, moving further north. So are we seeing catches sort of beginning to, to go into sort of parts of the North Sea and, and further up into the Celtic Sea and areas there. So I think all of those would also provide very important management questions. So if we were able to protect areas in the southwest, um, you know, what would be the implications of management measures elsewhere? So, as I said, uh, this was really just a brief snapshot from our report that we produced in 2018. It was really only just looking at some broad fisheries trends. Uh, the report itself included a lot more information about the fishery, um, which we will be talking about hopefully a lot more this afternoon. And I would like to also, I'm grateful, as I said, to my colleagues um, at the time, Rebecca Mitchell and Chloe North, and also for the figure updates from Sam and Freddie at the Blue Marine Foundation. So. Thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. That was really informative. And now I'd like to hand over to Jacob, who's going to guide us through a Q&A. Thanks, Marvin. OK, so if um, Robert and Rachel would like to put on their cameras. There we go. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so in the Q&A box, we've got um, uh, well, a very simple one to start off, but uh, it'll, it'll probably be a, a know it or you don't kind of one. Um, from Sarah Heaney, she asks, how many individuals make up a tonne of cuttlefish on average? Um, Rachel, is that something you might have any insight into? I wish I did. I'm afraid I have no idea at all. Well, I do remember um, in the previous uh, film, I think, mentioned about the two different sizes. So that would be something maybe looked into. I absolutely agree. It would very much depend on the on the size, whether they're small juveniles or adults. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that either. Um, but it's a good question. Thanks, Faith. Um, I did a very quick Google, and it says they can reach up to four kilos um, in weight. So that would be a minimum of 250 per ton, but probably a bit more than that because you'll get a lot of small ones. Um, okay. There's then a, a question from Jose Pero Crespo, who asks Robert. Based on your experience in cephalopod fisheries in the Falklands, which management measures would you recommend for this fishery? He suggests minimum landing sizes, total allowable catches or temporal bands as some potentials. Yeah, very good question. And I think that the fishery in the Falkland Islands is quite different to what we see around the UK because it's really targeted by um, sort of a very select number of vessels. And it's wholly within sort of the, the waters of, well, certainly the, the Lollaghan fishery uh, of the jurisdiction of the Falkland Islands. So you have very much greater control of, of sort of the fishery management measures. But generally, um, at the time when I was involved, they had um, pre-recruit surveys so that they could determine what the abundance of uh, the cephalopod was at the beginning of the fishing season. And then they used in-season monitoring of catches and effort 
to determine how uh, the abundance of this population was declining as the fishery continued to operate. So at the time, they then decided uh, on a minimum escapement. So we made some predictions about what the population size was. And then we said uh, sort of an arbitrary figure, which seemed to be uh, somewhat consistent with management approaches that was successful. I think it was about 20% uh, of the population. So once we thought that the population had reached that uh, uh, figure, that management measure, uh, we closed the fishery. So that's one way you can do it, but that's that's it's much more complex around the UK because you know there's there's different fleets uh, and gear types operating. So certainly, you know, there will be things um, minimum size. I think could be a, a very important one to protect juveniles, but also sort of temporal zones as well. Spatial and temporal zones could play an important part um, in the management of this as well. But I think this is something that we will talk about in the next session as well, sort of. Uh, and, elaborated on but that that was sort of the experience that we had thank you very much robert rachel did you want to come in on that did i say a hand or? yeah i mean just to add um you know the bean troll fishery in the channel is very diverse i mean you get up to about 80 species regularly landed in that so it does make uh, management and control of one particular species quite difficult Thank you very yes, much. Definitely. Thanks both. Okay, we have a question from uh, Jerry. Um, I imagine it's probably Jerry Percy, who asks, when UK, when the UK licensed the predominantly Dutch fleet of fly sailors uh, post Brexit, um, we were assured that landings of non-quota species would be monitored at the landing support. He asks, what level of landings of cuttlefish have this element of the fleet landed this year? Is that something either of you have any insight into at the moment? This is something we could potentially... Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, unfortunately, I don't. The data that I've got today is UK landings. And um, so I'm really in a position where I, I can't answer that at all as much as I'd like to. I don't know if Robert can add anything to that. Uh, I haven't got any other information to hand, I'm afraid. But, um, it might be something that we could dig into afterwards uh, if there's interest. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have that that's on uh, available yet. Thanks both. Perhaps that's something that would, um, we've got the discussion forum coming next that might be an interesting thing to, to talk about there. Okay, there's also a question in the chat uh, from Freddie Watson who asks the MMO, this is one for Rachel, um, what the MMO is currently doing to manage cuttlefish and are there any plans for future management? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a little bit above my um, <laughs> knowledge levels, but I, I think um, definitely there is work going on to look at future management extending into what at the moment we call the non-quota species where there isn't any management. So all those things are being considered, cuttle as part of that as well. Um, but I, I'm afraid I'm just unable to elaborate on any detail um, of the approach. It, it might be more of a question later on but we'll come up in a discussion for DEFRA. I think they're here today. So uh, whether they can elaborate on that, I don't know. But yeah, sorry, I'm not able to answer a little bit more clearly. Thank you. Um, related uh, slightly to Jerry's question earlier, um, Sam mm. Fanshaw asks, um, has Brexit affected cuttlefish landings in any way? Um, I guess either within the UK or wider EU, whatever you have insight into. Yeah, I mean, it's something that's not in the data. Um, I would say, um, you know, I can be corrected, but I, I think that although there were, when we, when we went, uh, when we actually came out of Europe um, on the 1st of January, um, there was a few hiccups on a few individual um, exports, but actually, you know, probably not enough to affect any data. Um, and so I, I, I think probably, that there's not really a reflection of that in the data that we've got. So I suspect not. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Um, it's now looking like it's just about time for the open forum, which uh, Morvan will be chairing. So thanks both for your answers and your presentations and I'll hand over to Morvan, thank you. Thanks very much, Jacob. So we're now moving on to the Fishery Perspectives Open Forum. So this is an opportunity for anyone who'd like to speak, but particularly if there are any fishermen or people who work in the fishing industry listening in, um, please do raise your hand. 
um, digitally and I can spot you and you can say something. I know um, Jerry just asked a question. So Jerry Percy, you're obviously in the audience from the new under 10 Fishermen's Association and perhaps you'd like to open this session with a perspective from, from you. Yeah, okay, uh, looking at my screen, can you hear me okay, Morgan? Yep, can you yeah, hear me? Good afternoon, great seminar, really useful, really timely. Um, I suppose my overall feeling at the moment is that it's, it's what we don't know rather than what we do know. Um, the, I'm surprised at some of the data because certainly the trap fishery in the Eastern Channel has been a very significant uh, element of the fishermen's income. And it's a, a, the old story of lies, damn lies and statistics. Um, I mean, these, these things might not show up on a, an economist spreadsheet so well, but they do make an important contribution to the income of that. The general discussions with fishermen in that area that their catches have been declining year on year. No one knows whether it was climate change or whether it was the increase in fishing effort further to the southwest. And I suppose the burning question is, what do we do, especially bearing in mind the new Fisheries Act and the requirements in there for sustainability. What do we do now to ensure the long-term sustainability of this stock, both biologically and socio-economically? Because obviously the Fisheries Act says that lack of scientific certainty should not be used as an excuse not to act. Um, I think we're going to hear something about the fisheries management plans later on, but that I suppose is and should be the biggest concern just to ensure that there is a fair balance of, of access to fishing opportunities and that the stock is not overfished. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Yes, I think there's always that question is how much science do you need before you act if you know there's quite a signal that something needs to happen. Um, please do raise your hand if you'd like to come back on that, but I'm going to now ask Richard Stride, a fisherman from Dorset, who we saw in that amazing film earlier on today to come in and share your thoughts. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as you would have learned from Rosie's film, I'm um, I'm a trap fisherman as far as cuttlefish is concerned, um, and I've been uh, fishing for cuttlefish since 1995. Um, I say that not to be boastful, but to just to indicate that in that time I've had quite a lot of opportunity to observe um, the fishery and the changes that have taken place and also to learn a bit about um, operating traps. And I've been a bit disappointed today in that um, there's been quite a lot of speculation about what the catch uh, data, the variation catch data has, has shown uh, us what, it, what it's all indicating. And I would have thought that um, CPUE um, could have been obtained from all the information which is routinely collected from from fishing vessels to actually get a better indicator of abundance. But what, what was notable from the landings was the, the the huge increase in 2017 in the trawl, the offshore trawl fishery landings. Um, when we began to get reports of this, when I say we as um, I, I mean um, we as uh, inshore fishermen with traps, we were dismayed to hear the reports of a bonanza in the southwest and even more dismayed to hear that um, trawlers had been coming from as far away as Shetland Isles to take part in the fishery. Um, it was clear to us then that our 2018 catches would be very much smaller and indeed they were. They were about a fifth of what we'd been getting. Um, whilst uh, there is um, interannual variation as Samantha pointed out, um, we are quite used to that. There is actually a two year cycle, which is fairly logical for our fishery because um, the fish come in after their, after two years. So if we get a good year, then there are um, more eggs laid that year. And then obviously two years later, we get another good year. But our 2018 catches slumped. We then predicted that the trawl fisheries catches would not see the same um, drop in 2018 and it didn't. And then our 2019 catches were also very, very poor. And um, by that year, of course, the trawl fishery had also feeling the effects of their high um, 
um, impact on the fishery in 2017. So it was all very uh, predictable to us. And to my mind, the elephant in the room here is the is this trawl fishery. Um, it, it seems odd to me that we have an unregulated fishery which is impacting mostly on immature cuttlefish. And even if they are not immature, um, they have, to my mind, by definition, not spawned and therefore um, are being denied that, that opportunity. So I, I, when it comes to talking about um, management, we are, are really um, desperate now to see some action taken to regulate the catch and not just on the grounds of who's catching most and uh, where the fishery is more important, but on the impact that the fishery the fishery has. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. You make some really excellent points. I'm going to ask Jean Paul to come in because he's got his hand up. Please, can I ask that you switch your video on so we can see you? And then I might come to CFAS and MMO afterwards to respond to some of what um, was being said there. Jean Paul. Yes. Um... <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Richard, for your uh, comments and, and questions. Um, first of all, I, I would like to reassure you uh, that uh, when we are uh, carrying out uh, stock assessments, we do use um, catch per unit of effort. We, we use uh, this kind of information to derive abundance indices. It's a, it's a rather complex uh, pro procedure uh, because we try to tend to, to take into account several um, factors affecting the, the, the catch per unit of effort, but uh, we, 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 we do use that. And of course, it's different when we look at uh, uh, CP, trawlers, CPUE, or, or, or traps, CPUE, which are uh, more difficult to, to handle. Um, then the, the, um, the, the, the point that you raise is, is uh, uh, in, a, in a second step, a question of uh, um, the, the, the way the different fishing fleets will share the results. And uh, this is something uh, that we have already demonstrated um, years ago and published in 2006, um, showing that, uh, of course, inshore uh, fisheries, spring uh, inshore fisheries were um, obviously dependent on the catch occurring before for on, on the cohort. So that's, uh, uh, that's something um, that uh, must be uh, organized, dealt with, but it's something which is just related to the life cycle of the species. Um, and um, my last point is about um, this, uh, what you've observed in, in 2018, with low catches in, in spring. Uh, this is most likely, we, we, we suspect that uh, this is a consequence of the high uh, landings uh, that occurred in, in, the, in the autumn 2017. Um, but uh, th since this uh, phenomenon was uh, rather local, uh, and uh, I'll show you that it, it well, or, uh, um, sorry, um, Robert Wakeford has already shown that uh, this was limited to some uh, ICS rectangles in the, in the western part of the channel. And uh, um, because of this local aspect of uh, what we suspect uh, was some overfishing, uh, we, we, this did, does not show when you, when you assess the wall stock for the, for the entire English channel. And unfortunately, we need more um, accurate, more detailed uh, models. Thank you, Jean-Paul. I think we've heard quite a lot about kind of more evidence is needed, more research and science. So I don't know if CFAS, Chris or Samantha, you could come in and maybe give us a bit of information about whether that is planned. Um, further research sounds like it's needed to plug some of these gaps. I don't know if either of you would care to come in. Or anyone else, please raise your hand and get involved. Samantha? Yes, so as, as, as we've all been mentioning, I think we do need more data. Um, 
and that is something that we are planning like i said we are we are wanting to do this um survey in terms of recruitment index i mean there is there is plans um in terms of getting more data in terms of coverage for the length observer program um so we have put in place um different different projects and that we aim to have for and that they all depend on funding of course um but there are a number of avenues that we are we are looking for um and i think it, it's it's also important to understand that it, it all takes time sadly in science and and resources are, aren't necessary and and we are trying and we are developing it as soon as fast as possible to be in line with the uk government's um, plans okay thanks samantha i don't know rachel if you could come in a little bit because i think a lot of the issues being discussed here are kind of that offshore fleet, which the MMO are responsible for. So maybe you could share some of your thoughts in relation to what was shared. Yeah, um, you know, it's very difficult um, for me to comment really, because um, I'm not involved in the sort of management um, and looking at those things in the, within the MMO or anything. So I, I just want to apologise, actually, because Richard Hoskin, who's our head of fisheries management, was due to be here today. And I'm sure he'd have been in a much better position to be able to comment. Um, and unfortunately, he was called away at the last minute for family emergency. So I just apologise. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, is there anything more specific that I can... That, that you want to ask me? <laughs> well, maybe Sorry. if we go to the, you know, People have mentioned this kind of 2017, 2018 increase in kind of catches from that offshore fleet. You know, what was the kind of response from MMO there and were any precautionary measures put in, you know, that fleet or any further investigation done? No, I don't think so at the time. I mean, it was very localised. Um, it was seen sort of, you know, by the fleet of a member very much as a great opportunity and it really took the pressure off what were quite tight sole quotas at the time. Um, so um, I think that we were aware, you know, that fishermen have more recently been asking for to look at um, the stock. Um, and again, I, I'm just in a difficult place because I, I don't really um, know the answer to what we've been doing. So I just apologise, I'm not able to, <laughs> to give that's, more that's information fine. today. No, that's Sorry. fine. Robert, you have your hand up and then Paul Naylor does as well. So I'll go to him after you. OK, thanks. Now, it's just a point really um, about uh, sort of the stock status and the management side of things. Um, it's I mean, when when you look at the landings, uh, um, you know, Richard was right. You need to look at the, the catch and the effort together, because just by having uh, looking at the landings uh, might indicate that you've got a, a really high abundance of the population. But actually, that just means that you could have, um, as it would appear, sort of a high level of fishing effort as, as well going in to, to remove sort of a part of the population. So you definitely need to look at both the catch and effort in tandem. Um, and, and one of the things uh, which I think we've talked about is trying to forecast ahead of time, you know, whether it's a good or a bad year. Um, because just looking at the landings data, you would suggest that 2017 was a bumper year. It was fantastic. Well, that might be partly true, but um, there's other things as well that, uh, in my experience, you know, helps to make predictions. And we, we heard that um, the recruitment is highly variable uh, from year to year, and that's partly dependent on the water temperature and other things, pred predation and so forth. And um, one of the things that we found out is that there's a relationship between water temperature and recruitment. So we were able to, in the Falkland Islands, for example, make some future predictions in the following year to see whether we we're expecting a good or a bad year, depending on the previous sort of water temperature hatching and so forth. So there's a lot of uncertainty around it, but it was able to give some sort of form of prediction. And then that was teamed up with a pre-recruit survey to see whether the two actually met, because actually, even though you can um, uh, protect a lot of the eggs, um, they have a high mortality by the time they hatch, um, even through the natural environment. Um, so, you know, it's only until they actually enter the fishery that you really know what the, the actual population abundance is likely to be in that season. Um, and then just sort of touching on some of the other measures there. I mean, obviously, there's um, a lot of eggs have been found on, on the gears, on the static gears. And one of the things might also be to, to put more sort of uh, static gear that's not used for fishing, perhaps, you know, um, 
other means to actually encourage um, uh, you know, laying of eggs on, on solid structures in some of the inshore areas, perhaps you know, some of the protected areas, you know, to encourage this recruitment in some areas. Um, that might already be done in some areas and be able to show whether that's been successful or not. But it seems like there's very much a localized impact. So, you know, might have high catches in, in the offshore, which might then lead to a direct low catches later on in the season, which might not be reflected as a whole across the whole population. So it's, it's quite granular, you know, and getting that data is quite time consuming and expensive. And I think for this sort of particular small scale fisheries as well, getting uh, the fleets involved in some of the data collection or even just one or two sentinel species um, fisheries, uh, I think could be very useful to provide that information. But that's just my perspective. So thank you. Thanks, Robert. I think involving fishermen is absolutely crucial to good fisheries management. So I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with that last point. We've got a hand up from Paul Naylor and then I'm going to go to a question in the chat and then I'll come to you, Richard, uh, Jerry and Richard. So, Paul, could you come in with your question, please? Um, yes, I, I, I'm always nervous when I hear people say that more data is needed. I mean, more data is clearly needed here, but um, it would worry me if that was used as a reason for not acting on a precautionary basis, looking at some of the worrying declines. And I thought the first speaker, I think, in this open um, forum session made a very good point that, that the paucity of, of trend data shouldn't be used as a reason for not acting um, quickly. So I think it would just be just brilliant for once for us not to put conservation measures in when it was very late in the day for a species, especially just such a wonderful species as this. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think this links to a comment a question by Francis Binney from Marine Resources in Jersey, who says, if we lack data, should we not be applying the precautionary principle for the stock until we know what is a safe MSY? Absolutely. Yes. Precautionary principle. Definitely. Brilliant. Samantha, I can see you. So you want to come back on that? Before yes. You very much. Uh, yes. I was just going to say, I mean, yes, of course, a precautionary principle would would be useful, but to know what a precautionary principle is, you need to be able to have an assessment. Otherwise, you don't know what you're advising is precautionary or not. So you kind of go around in circles in that sense. You, you do need to have a basis of an assessment at least, and then you can try and in my opinion, have a, a precautionary approach, yes. Um, but if you have an assessment, you don't know. Okay, thanks. Well, I'm really hoping that when we hear from DEFRA later about their plans for the fish management plans, we will hear that assessments are top of the list for all their chosen species. Jerry, could you come in and then Richard, um, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Maud. It was only just a, a slight point when we were talking about survival of eggs. Um, in former life, I ran a European organisation and we had a, a group of fishermen in southeast Spain who had actually got grant funding and developed a hatchery. Uh, they were trap fishermen predominantly and they saved all the eggs and brought them back into the hatchery, uh, hatched them and then put them back. And the, the success rate was very significant. So there's more than one way to, to, to do this sort of thing if we're trying to enhance the stock. Thank you, that's really interesting. It'd be great to hear more about that if you have any links or contacts. Um, Richard, do you want to come in? If you can, put your video on so we yeah, can see you. And I find, I've got no way of doing that, I don't think. Okay. Um, um, the, um, yeah, further to what Jerry was saying, um, we, well, at least I do, not everyone practices this, but I, if it is necessary to remove eggs from the traps, as uh, we sometimes do because they're blocking the entrances, um, we, I, what I do is I store them in, um, in the, in the trays which are used to transport prawns. We put those in store pots and they all hatch out. Obviously, one of the problems with having them all hatch out in one place is that they, obviously, what what the cuttlefish look for when they lay their eggs is a substrate to attach the eggs on, but also a source of food for the for the hatchlings. And if they're too many of them hatching in one place, I can see that could cause a problem. But I, I did want to point out something which is not often recognised about trap fisheries. Um, in our area, the um, sex ratio in the catch is five males to every female. Um, and that's quite a significant um, um, finding. This came from data that we recorded 
over three cuttlefish seasons, uh, which we provided to Bournemouth University in connection with a study of the impact of um, the famous Bournemouth surf reef. Um, and um, it is in, in those days, we didn't uh, have quite so much trouble as we do today in obtaining female cuttlefish to leave in the trap. It's generally we leave one fish in there. It's more effective to leave a female and most fishermen these days in the trap fishery complain that they don't catch enough. So that's um, a significant ratio. In By comparison in nets, uh, trammel nets and trawls, they tend to catch equal numbers of um, males and females, although I have no uh, data to support that. Um, the other, the other th notable thing that um, today with some of the catch statistics was the very low level of landings recorded for traps nowadays. There were some of the ports in the southeast uh, had less than 30 tons um, landed in each year. I, 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 I can remember years when, um, when I, I landed uh, 20 tons and in Muddyford, which is a very small place, probably landed 100 tons between uh, in the for the fleet. So um, the the trap fishery has a a great potential if only the um, cuttlefish can come into breed. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Richard. I think we've heard quite a lot this this afternoon about the differences between the different gear types and and probably needing different management strategies for each. So that's really good, Richard. And I think we're going to be hearing from the IFCAs in the next session. So hopefully they can talk more about the trap fisheries, which predominantly are happening um, inshore in their, their districts. So we're now, if, does anyone else have any questions? Raise your hand now. If any of the panelists would like to come back to anything that was just said, please do jump in. Breathe for a minute and let you have a chance. No, okay. We're now going to take a short break um, we're going to be come back at four o'clock, so that's um, literally in seven minutes. Um, please go and have a cup of tea, um, coffee, water, um, and we'll see you back here at four where we'll be starting um, quite sharpish. So thank you all the panellists and everyone so far.
Hello everyone, hopefully everyone is making their way back to their seats and ready for the next session. Welcome back. We're, so we're now moving into session three of the symposium, looking at management. So I'm sure this will be a really great session. There will be time for a few questions at the end of the session, so please write any questions you have in the Q&A box as we go. If I could also ask people to um, say which speaker you'd like your question to be aimed at, that would be brilliant. So first, I'm really pleased to welcome back Dr. Chris Barrett from CFAS, who's going to give us a global view of cuttlefish management. So if I can hand over to you, Chris. Thank, Thank you, you, Morgan. <clears throat> Hi, everyone again. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the current paper I'm leading, which is a global review of cuttlefish fisheries management. Oh, sorry, I'm not on video. Hopefully you can see me now. Um, so I wanted to talk about the current work I'm doing on a global review of cuttlefish fisheries management, uh, specifically reviewing methods to reduce unwanted fishing mortality and other human threats like marine pollution, um, all in aid of sustaining cuttlefish populations. So this work first came about as I was involved in writing the first ever marine fish conservation synopsis for Cambridge's conservation evidence team. And this book is now published and I'm happy to email a PDF if you send me your email addresses. And really what this is, is standardized plain English summaries from thousands of peer reviewed publications, which implies some sort of conservation evidence for marine fish. So it could be from spatial closures through to changes in trawl mesh sizes. So it's like a directory of evidence for anyone to refer to, to know what does and doesn't work in conservation, how it was done, that kind of thing. And the text just here next to the picture of the book is showing you the format that each intervention is written in. Um, so that's easy to interpret for anyone who might want to try and protect a particular species or a stock. And these papers were selected from something like 20 journals, which were recommended to us by an expert panel. But perhaps because of the nature of the synopsis, so this one's a marine fish synopsis, there's barely any mention of cephalopods. Uh, there's just like a few records where cephalopods were part of a bycatch where a fin fishery um, was trying to be conserved. But as we all know, cuttlefish were the fifth most valuable fishery to England in 2018, worth 14.9 million. So because of how valuable this fishery are, um, I wanted to try and produce something similar to the uh, marine fish conservation evidence synopsis, but specific to cuttlefish. So it's now a paper in progress and some of the co-authors are in the symposium today. Um, given the global scale I wanted to capture, naturally it's meant having a lot of experts from all over the world. So now we've captured evidence from Europe, Asia, Australia and Africa on things like fisheries closures, voluntary measures, egg preservation studies, minimum landing sizes, gear selectivity, fish aggregation devices. Um, so my uh, screen has just gone off, sorry. There we go. Uh, restocking, the use of citizen science and cuttlefish's responses to pollution. And because it's unpublished, I can't go into many specific details, but I did want to give a basic overview of some of the findings although I'll purposely exclude the great work done in the UK by staff from the IFCAs and the citizen science groups, because I know they're here today, they're going to present or they have presented some of their work. So I don't want to sort of repeat what they've said or steal the thunder of their work. And finally, I hope you'll understand that because it's unpublished, I can't really share any figures or photos or any fine details at this stage. So please forgive me for the sort of lack of detail on the next few slides. So one example in Vietnam, um, evidence my colleague who does cephalopod research in Vietnam suggests that over there, they have a network of small MPAs, but the evidence suggests that these MPAs don't really ensure the conservation of cuttlefish because cuttlefish migrate, they migrate beyond the MPA boundaries. So it's therefore been suggested that MPAs should be expanded through things like having buffer areas where only some fishers can fish, and then that might uh, support uh, the conservation. So I keep losing the screen. And as we all know as well with the MPAs, they'd also need strict controls and strict enforcement for them to be effective. So in Spain, um, fishers have pledged voluntarily to increase mesh sizes of trammel nets to reduce the capture of small cuttlefish and also reduce the discards and bycatch mortality. They've also agreed to limit the trammel net lengths 
And then, sorry, the screen is playing up for me. Just bear with me. Um, and then also for the basket traps, they wanted to add lids close to the trap entrances during periods of no fishing. Um, and then at the end of the cuttlefish fishing season, leave traps in situ for a month to allow the eggs to hatch. And then finally, limit the number of baskets um, per boat as well. And there, fishers have also volunteered to record biology data of cuttlefish, also including the sex, the size and the weight, along with fishery characteristics, such as the fishing effort and areas fished. So Richard Stride and Pete Dads, no pressure for you there. Off Australia, uh, the prawn trawlers tend to catch cuttlefish with small specimens going back as discards. And there's been lots of gear selectivity studies, mainly by people like Matt Broadhurst, uh, which have been trialled, but with very limited success. And so far, it seems that the only option showing promise is when there's no delay between stopping to the gear and then winching the trawl to the surface. So this is tried on a square mesh, 85 millimeter mesh trawl. And when there was no delay, the cuttlefish catches were low. But then again, the replication was limited to only eight hauls, so it might not be a conclusive strategy yet. And also using the slower speeds and fishing in slower, uh, <clears throat> shallower depths resulted in lower cuttlefish catches across all sizes. So even the large cuttlefish that were sort of targeted was fewer caught. Um, so maybe it's also the case that there just weren't cuttlefish at these particular depths. And it's also unclear as to what effect this has on target, say, finfish species. So in the southeastern Arabian Sea, so off India, uh, they use hook and line um, fishing, historically used as, well, with fish aggregation devices, which can be as simple as using tree branches in the water to attract cuttlefish. Um, so they attract the cuttlefish close to the surface for them to then catch, but as most of the cuttlefish are attracted to these devices, so adult spawners um, attracted to lay the eggs on the structures, most of these adult spawners were captured before they had the chance to sort of spawn and lay eggs. So it's considered therefore that a significant portion of the population was being rapidly removed and as such the populations weren't sustainable. So then off India they had this fish aggregating device ban um, in 2012 in the coastal waters and then after that catches increased two and a half times the following year. So they did believe that this ban on aggregation devices did work for the conservation of the coral fish populations there. Then in Japan, and this is what we mentioned before, I think in the comments to my previous presentation. Um, first, I think it's important to showcase not only what has worked, but also what hasn't worked to help people avoid trialing something that's been discredited elsewhere or make them mindful to modify the methods perhaps. So off Japan, cuttlefishes are a popular sport fishing target, and it's caught recreationally with no regulations on how the recreational fishers fish. So from 2001 to 2003, the Japanese government designed and conducted the restocking program, and it ultimately produced over 317,000 eggs from only 200 cuttlefish. And then almost 200,000 of those juveniles were marked and released, but like I said earlier on, only between 0.02 and 0.08% of these will be captured. So potentially hatch and release could increase the total numbers of cuttlefish in the wild, probably due to the increased egg survivability in the aquaria. But as the yield per release rate remained low, they've so far considered this uneconomically viable. So that's just a very brief overview of some of the examples. It is a lot more comprehensive than that. But like I say, I can't really go into too many specifics yet until it's published, um, at which point I'll be happy to send the paper around. Um, and just as a heads up, I'm also doing similar papers for octopus and also squids. So again, if you feel you can contribute or just want to be kept in the loop, please let me know or drop me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. That was really interesting and excited for the paper to be published. We're now moving the focus to the IFCAS um, and we'll hear from Rob Clark, the Chief Officer of the Association of IFCAS, who's going to um, lead us through the next few talks. Over to you, Rob. Hello and good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to the organisers of today's important symposium, uh, to the speakers and to the participants for the interesting debate that's emerging through this forum. I work for the Association of Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authorities, 
the association is the national voice of the 10 IFCAs in England. I'm delighted to be here today, albeit virtually, to discuss and consider how we can work together with the industry, scientists and managers to support the long-term health of UK cuttlefish populations and to support the coastal fisheries and communities which rely on those stocks. The 10 IFCAs in England are committees of local government. It's great to see a number of the IFCA members here today. Through our governance structure, we bring together members appointed from, amongst others, the commercial and scientific community with local politicians to develop management and conduct research to support sustainable inshore fisheries to six nautical miles. We seek to balance the needs of different users of fisheries resources and manage fishing in marine protected areas. It brings me great, <laughs> brings me great pleasure to introduce colleagues from three of the South Coast Ithkas to hear about their work in the local community to conduct local cuttlefish research and implement local cuttlefish management. We will hear about initiatives to mitigate the impact of cuttlefish traps on egg production, to understand the biology of the cuttlefish and the work of the IFCAs to protect the essential habitats of cuttlefish. Looking to the future and the importance of this symposium, we're particularly interested in the opportunities that the New Fisheries Act provides to embed inshore fisheries management into a wider system of English fisheries management so as to secure the fair and equitable long-term sustainability of this fishery. So with no further ado from me, I'd like to introduce my colleagues from the South Coast Ithkas to present on their innovative work and to show how they've been developing research and management along the inshore coast of the English Channel. First up is Sarah Clark, the Deputy Chief Officer from Devon and Severn Ithka. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, yeah, um, as I've been introduced, I work for Devon and Seven IFCA, and um, I should be talking about some of the research we've done and some of the management. So we've already had a lot of presentations on the landings of cuttlefish, and I just, just can reiterate that the um, landings into Devon are make up a huge amount of the land is into English ports, up to 79% in 2019. And 53% of those landings were for under 10 metre vessels. Now in the, um, the Devon and Seven Ithka district, the fishery takes place mostly in South Devon. And we've already heard about the huge landings into Brixham and Plymouth along the South Devon coast, reaching our almost 4,000 tonnes in 2019 worth 10 million pounds. And as we've heard, mostly it's from the larger vessels, but the under 10 meter vessels did land up to sort of about 274 tons worth 700,000 pounds. And we've already heard about the mix of the fishery that it involves the inshore um, pop fishery, the slightly to mid to, um, to inshore uh, otter trawl fishery and the offshore beam uh, trawl fishery. So really we have to, when we look at management, perhaps look at all those together rather than separating one off. Um, but in our district, the inshore pop fishery takes place, as heard before, um, in three months between April and June. But some of the um, Devon ports are dependent on cuttlefish for their landings. We've heard how important they are for Brixham and Plymouth. But in fact, other ports such as Exmouth, I mean, they have landings of about 28 tonnes in 2019. And even a small port like Torquay um, had uh, almost 11 tonnes of cuttlefish landed. So I'm just going to run through a little bit of research that we do. Um, uh, Devon and Seven Ifka are involved in a, a project called Cresh, which uh, Jean-Paul was also involved in. Um, and that looked at cephalopod recruitment from English Channel spawning habitat. And that happened back in 2019 to 2012 with English and French partners. And we work very closely with a PhD, PhD student, uh, Isabel Bleu. And she did a lot of work at looking at the spawning strata preferences. And this has come up in uh, previous presentations. And she worked um, on her thesis and also with an MSc student. And she found through uh, multiple dive surveys um, within Tor Bay that uh, where seagrass, um, Zostra marina is present, it is actually the preferred substrate for egg attachment. Um, and where it isn't present, then artificial media is used for um, egg laying. And um, as we've heard about the egg laying on pots, we did actually go out with one fisherman and he hauled up three pots 
and Isabel and I uh, removed 8,000 cuttlefish eggs from three pots and then we housed them into small trays uh, which we put back in, you know, into the sea to um, allow them to hatch. So it just shows how you know you get these huge densities on the pots. Um, some of that project also looked at um, uh, movements of cuttlefish by tagging some cuttlefish from uh, Torquay and they were often, often found not only to have site fidelity um, while they were egg laying, but also to move along the coast. Now, um, unlike some of the, um, uh, perhaps the wishes of the audience that we will be talking about direct management of the cuttlefish population, our management mostly relates to um, the habitats where cuttlefish are targeted and the potential fishery impacts. Um, we have, uh, as you've heard, how important where seagrass is present, um, that, that they're very important for um, egg laying by cuttlefish. And we have quite extensive beds in Tor, Tor Bay and also in the Sulcum Yarm um, estuaries and the Plymouth Sound. And we've undertaken seagrass surveys um, over the past few years from 2012. And this was supported in 2019 by an environment agency survey that was funded by Natural England. So a lot of our uh, research has focused on the Tor Bay MCZ because the seagrass beds are a designated feature and they are quite extensive. And we've done surveys by drop down camera um, going across to measure the extent and density of the beds. And in 2017, uh, we um, estimated there was 116 hectares of seagrass. So this important habitat um, for cuttlefish and other juvenile fish was quite extensive and that's actually increasing. And, and the 2019 survey by the Environment Agency also showed that the beds were increasing. So um, what we decided to do uh, working with Cornwall IFCA was a um, side scan survey of Tool Bay to see if there were any unexplored or unfound um, seagrass beds within the bay that we might need to protect um, further than we do. But um, through a uh, side scan sonar, we used uh, GoPros to uh, ground truth and signature, but no new beds were identified. But also as part of this survey, we decided to do a potting impact study by putting GoPros on, um, on pots, um, on single pots, and also on a string of four cuttle pots, because we are aware that the fishers within Tor Bay use both single pots or uh, small short strings of pots. And when we um, did the um, deploying and hauling of the pots, we found that where there was a single pot, there was minimal impact on the seagrass. But where you had string, uh, a string of four pots, there was some impact on the last two pots that were hauled, the third and fourth pot. So what we have already done is an assessment on within the MCZ of potting, but we will review that assessment with the um, data and the information we got from 2020. And we also undertook a fishing activity survey, which we only had a 50% response to in 2020. Um, and they indicated about 370 pots were deployed within the MCZ. And we, we appreciate this is probably an underestimation. So we need to gather more information on that. We've also done some other research on the impact um, to investigate the impact of otter trawling for cuttlefish on the mud habitat in Tor Bay MCZ. And we've talked about otter trawling um, and in particular the increase in otter trawling for cuttlefish. And there was a small amount of otter trawling within the MCZ. So what we did is we did a survey um, working um, ourselves with ocean ecology and sea fish. And we put um, GoPro cameras on uh, light otter trawls and heavy otter trawls to look at the impact on the mud habitat. And um, we found that um, that there wasn't really any, any there was a minimal impact from the uh, light otter trawls in terms of the sediment bloom. But we worked on a uh, before and after and control impact study with ocean ecology um, to further this uh, uh, investigation of impact. And they looked at a control and a towed area within Tall Bay MCZ and using the heavy and light otter trawls and they did grab samples, but they found no detectable impact on the subtype of habitat all the assemblages through using the light or the heavy otter trawls. But there were limitations, as always with studies, where we didn't look at the penetration of the gear or the otter trawl or the otter doors. And also it was a very quick survey before and after, and we didn't investigate the longer term impacts. So um, monitoring was recommended through that study. 
And um, mo moving now um, with the information that we have to hand, um, moving on to how we've done some management uh, for the cuttlefish fishery within our district. Now, back in 2014, we introduced a mobile fishing permit bylaw and where all mobile gear vessels were required to have a permit to fish in our district. And that allowed us to set um, spatial restrictions. And part of those spatial restrictions included um, removing um, demersal gear from a large part of the Tall Bay MCZ, which protected the seagrass. And in so doing, um, you know, you're protecting the spawning um, of the egg laying habitat for cuttlefish. And um, <clears throat> We were aware that there was a small scale uh, trawl fishery within the Tall Bay MCZ. So we've um, allowed that demersal uh, fishing activity to take place for the three months of the year um, when the, the cuttlefish come in to lay their eggs so that, that that small scale fishery can continue as well. But we've also developed a monitoring control plan of the trawl fishery within the MCZ. And we fact found that actually the fishery is reduced year on year with only one vessel operating in 2019. So um, I've talked a lot about the habitat that cuttlefish um, lay their eggs on, in particular the seagrass, and we've shown that the um, beds are actually increasing within the Tall Bay MCZ. And we are currently reviewing our mobile fishing permit bylaw and we look at and the permit conditions. So we um, are considering whether to actually restrict the demersal gear from operating near the seagrass beds even further so that those beds are protected. But we've also introduced a potting permit bylaw and those conditions of the potting permit can be adapted if we need to manage the pot fishery. So through these bylaws, we can bring in management measures, not only for the impacts of the, uh, of the pot fishery or the, or, or the trawl fishery for cuttlefish, but also to um, protect the cuttlefish stocks. And that's something that we can consider in the future. Um, and also, you know, our, our bylaws are, are very useful in terms of any other projects that come up because there is a seagrass restoration project happening within Tall Bay MCZ where they're actually relaying 1.5 hectares of seagrass seedlings. And we have the potential to introduce management to check that seagrass. Um, that could be voluntarily or through our management measures. But I wanted to go back to the Crest project. We liaise um, extensively with um, local fishermen who pot fish within the district. And they talked about the amount of cuttlefish um, that lay eggs on their pots. We've already shown how many we counted on those three pots. So there was a, a suggestion that the, the fishers um, leave their pots in the water at the end of the season rather than removing them and jet washing them. And many of the, of the fishers do this still to date after 10 years after the project. And the only other thing I wanted to add is that we're about to hear about the fisheries management plan for cuttlefish and Devon and Seven IFCA um, have uh, are part way through developing a cuttlefish research and management plan and hopefully that's something that can feed into the national plan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed Sarah for sharing your important work. It's really fantastic to hear about the work of Devon and Seven IFCA and the importance of protecting um, essential habitats for cuttlefish and also to provide evidence to support fine scale interventions to support sustainable fisheries. I'm really now pleased to, to introduce my, my former colleague, Chloe Smith from Southern IFCA. Thank you very much, Chloe. Thank you, Rob. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you to those who've organised this really excellent event. I'm, I'm really enjoying it, so I hope everyone else is. Today, I'll briefly cover the work Southern Ithaca have done with regards to cuttlefish and pot fishing in the past and a little more recently. So in the Southern Ithaca district, we have an important cuttlefish trap fishery, as you've heard from uh, Richard Stride and others earlier, which operates between April and July every year. In 2019, the cuttlefish was the fifth largest species in terms of catch in our district, so, so really, really valuable to our local fishers. There's also a small inshore trawl fishery, which is greatly limited by our maximum 12 metre vessel bylaw. Although in more recent years, the proportion of cuttlefish caught in trawls compared to pots has been increasing, in part because catch of cuttlefish from traps has been falling, for example, in 2016, 280 tonnes were caught by traps in our district, but only 70 tonnes were caught in 2019. 
And as you can see from my, my very small little graph there, that the value of cuttlefish peaked, as you saw earlier in, in a few of the other presentations, but has since started to fall. Whilst the Southern Ithaca District does not have any mandatory management for cuttlefish at the moment, we do have a cuttlefish code of practice, which was, which was developed with industry and introduced back in 2014. The code encourages fishers to leave their traps in the water until the attached cuttlefish eggs have hatched. The Ithaca promote that fishers follow the code of practice, but there are other ideas about how to preserve cuttlefish eggs. For example, some prefer to take the eggs off by hand during hauling and release them straight back to the sea, where they believe that the, the cuttlefish eggs may dry out on the deck of the vessel over the course of the summer. Whilst others feel a risk of losing their expensive gear through theft or bad weather is too high risk to follow the code. Over the past few years, Southern Ithaca have been undertaking an inshore pot fisheries management review. And a lot of cuttlefish were mentioned throughout this. In the call for information, which we held back in 2018, six fishers raised concerns regarding the impact of the offshore cuttlefish trawl fishery, including that they felt that the trawl fishery, the cuttlefish pot fishery has decreased due to the impacts of the offshore mm -hmm. trawl fishery, and that the mm -hmm. offshore fishery takes small individuals that have not yet bred, mm -hmm. and that, mm -hmm. oh, apologies, that have not yet bred, and it takes small individuals and it efforts that operates at a high effort and unsustainable level. Meanwhile, four respondents actively express support for the cuttlefish code of practice in their responses. At the beginning of 2020, the authority held an informal consultation in which fishers were asked if they thought a cuttlefish pot limit should be introduced. The results of which are presented here and show a mixed response. 52 felt that the pot limit should be mandatory and that the that should be set at between 100 or 200 pots the majority felt however a further 48 found that cuttlefish pot limits should not be mandatory either voluntary or not introduced at all during the second consultation a number of consultees highlighted their support for the code of practice again and again showed concern about the offshore cuttlefish trawl fishery Following the consultation, our authority held a number of working groups in which members considered the results of the consultation along with other evidence. So, what is the way forward for cuttlefish fisheries in the Southern Ithaca district? Southern Ithaca will continue to work with DEFRA and other fisheries organisations to manage the fishery at the stock scale in order to specifically address the issues that have been raised today that might be present regarding the sustainability of practices occurring outside the district. In the district, however, the Southern Ithaca will consider making a pot fishing bylaw once it has been through the appropriate QA. The bylaw will permit the use of all pot types within the district, including cuttle traps. At the time of the bylaw's introduction, however, no specific cuttle management will be introduced. And this is based on the um, lack of current detailed stock assessment that's relevant to our district and also the mixed responses that I showed you earlier of the consultations. However, the bylaw would produce a facility to introduce permit conditions to manage the fishery within the district, and therefore we could react to harvest control rules in response to changes in cuttlefish stock status in the future. Furthermore, the introduction of the bylaw will provide a better understanding of the trap fishery operating within our district, and open up a really clear communication channel with all of the fishers who are active within it. We plan to update our cuttlefish code of practice to better reflect the practices that fishers are currently carrying out to protect cuttle eggs and to recommend a pot limit of 300 pots which will align with Sussex Ithaca. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very much indeed Chloe, it's really great to hear about the work of Southern Ithaca in developing bottom-up management measures and the importance of working with the local community to develop well-evidenced and supported management measures through local engagement and consultation. Moving further to the east once more, um, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, my colleague Dr Jen Luth from Sussex Ithaca. Thank you very much, Jen. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for the invite and introduction Rob. 
it's great to be part of this important symposium. Um, I'm Jen Lewis, the Senior Research Officer at Sussex Africa, F IFCA, and I'm just going to give a brief talk about our cuttlefish research and management in Sussex inshore waters. So it's a brief out, uh, outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give a bit of a background to the cuttlefish in Sussex. And so that's the inshore waters of Sussex out to six nautical miles, our district. Uh, go through a couple of different research projects that we've done and how they relate to our management. And then go through what current management measures that we have that are relevant to cuttlefish. So this is a bit of an overview of the Sussex fishery. You can see from these fishing effort grid maps, which are, these are derived from sightings data from our patrol vessel, which are adjusted for patrol effort, averaged over 2015 to 2019. So these show most of the activity for cuttlefish potting in the west of our district uh, between Selsey and Shoreham. Uh, but there's also activities over in the in the east towards Hastings and Eastbourne. Um, and this is this is just for the cuttlefish traps because that's the main method for inshore fisheries in Sussex, but they are also targeted by fixed net, net fisheries using trammel nets and also picked up in trawls. And here you can also see the MMO landings data that reflects a lot of what we've seen today from in the other presentations. Um, so that that, so these are from the ICs rectangles that cover our district, not just within our district, and there seems to be a general downward trend. Um, and the, you can also see in the graph in the bottom right here, the average annual landing data by port. So you can see the most important ports are um, Selsey, Littlehampton and Shoreham in the west of the district and also Hastings and Eastbourne in the east. And as we've heard from many of the other presenters, the main thing that's thought to affect cuttlefish stock status is in the inshore environment is that potting activity generally occurs during the breeding season and then eggs are laid on the traps by females. And then when these traps are hauled, these eggs can be damaged, potentially affecting recruitment into the fishery in the long term. So the couple of research projects that I'm going to talk about now relate to this. So in 2007, there was a project that looked at receptors for cuttlefish eggs. Uh, this is when there was no directed cuttlefish management within our district. And this project looked at using artificial egg receptors to mitigate the overexploitation and reduce egg mortality associated with the trap fisheries. And the aims of this project was to document the cuttlefish fishery of the Sussex coast and describe it also describe the biology of cuttlefish in Sussex and to describe the effectiveness of the current management techniques for cuttlefish management and to evaluate the effectiveness of techniques to mitigate egg mortality associated with fishing practices. And to do this primary, um, and to do this, the method they deploy, they deployed egg receptors off the Sussex coast and there were also some seabed surveys with divers and remotely operated vehicles and underwater vehicles and that was to look at the difference between how many eggs were laid on these receptors compared to the seabed. The, from the results of this study there were 50% of the uprights of these artificial receptors had laid, eggs laid on them so they were a successful artificial substrate. Uh, the traps did still to con continue to attract cuttlefish eggs um, and they also found that there was little to no cuttlefish eggs on the nearby seabed from the ROV surveys. Um, and one of the suggestions from this, re uh, from this research was to put removable egg receptors within the traps. So there was another study done later in 2018, um, and this was also to reduce the mortality of cuttlefish eggs. And there were three main aims of this project. There was, again, a literature review and a stakeholder review of UK cuttlefish um, to reduce the impact of trap fishing on eggs. And the third work stream was to look at egg survival rate and quality in how, and how they hatched in laboratory conditions. So I'm just going to talk about the methods for the work streams, work, pro work projects two and three. So that was the impact of trap fishing on eggs and the egg survivability. Um, so the methods for the, for the reduction of trap fishing on impact of trap fishing on eggs, they, we used three different types of substrate, which were removable 
egg receptors within the traps, polypropylene rope, willow whips, and the trap entrance fingers that you've seen in previous pictures. And then in terms of looking at the hatching rates under different conditions, uh, there were different controlled environments looking at different temperatures, water flow, and substrate. And this was to look at whether when those eggs that had been taken off the traps and released into the waters, whether or not they would, what kind of levels of survivability that they would have. So in terms of the receptors, all three types of materials had greater than 15% of the total number of eggs left on the trap. Uh, and then the total number of eggs in the trap were attached to the receptors. And these were more able to be easily removed from the fishing gear and returned to sea compared to unmodified traps. Um, and the, the polypropylene rope exceeded the other mod modifications in all aspects. So it had a higher percentage of eggs deposited in it. It required less time and effort to remove the eggs from it. And it was also the preferred modification by participating fishers in terms of how much time it took. And I think there was also an increased number of cuttlefish found within those traps that had the rope in as well. And in terms of results from the hatching study, um, the, it, this, it really highlighted the significant impact of the environmental conditions on cuttlefish embryo development and the success of hatching. Um, it's possible for the dislocated eggs to develop and hatch as long as the environmental conditions are not too harsh um, in terms of the temperature and the substrate, but free floating eggs are a lot less likely to develop. Um, and just before I go on to that, so the management implications of this, so as in other areas, a lot of the local potters leave their pots in the water uh, to allow the eggs to hatch. And with regards to the receptors, we haven't brought that in to our management yet. Um, although rope was shown to have a positive effect here, it's not yet been incorporated, partly because um, there, there wasn't a very large effect of the rope, but also there are, there's a separate issue of potential plastic pollution from leaving these polypropylene ropes in the water from the release of fibres from those ropes. So the University of Brighton is currently investing in the development of a similar type of substrate made from algal material that would be used instead of this rope that could be left in the sea. Um, and as with the other Ifkas that we've heard from, um, if, if, if more concrete evidence does show that these, these substrata will help the recruitment of the fishery, then we have flexible permit conditions to make amendments to our shellfish bylaw restrictions, which I'll talk about shortly now. So we've got a shellfish permit bylaw that's been in place since 2016 for pot and trap shellfish fisheries. And this includes effort and gear restrictions to enable controls and the impacts of fishing activity on the shellfish populations. So this bylaw also requires all permit holders to provide shellfish catch and fishing effort information to support our fisheries and also any future management measure reviews. And you can see here from this graph that cuttlefish is the second most important shellfish species by live weight caught across the Sussex district after whelk. I think the percentage is wrong for some reason on this graph, but I think it makes up about 11% of the total shellfish landings across our district. And the gear restrictions for cuttlefish traps are limited to 300 per permit within the IFCA six nautical miles district um, for commercial permits and two traps for recreational permit holders. And from this data, we can look at the differences in catches spatially across the district. So the four areas at the bottom are the areas that this data is reported into. Um, and you can see the total landings weight, and we can also calculate the landings per unit effort. So that's the average weight per pot. And cuttlefish, in case it's a bit small, is the one in green. And from this, again, we can also look at seasonality. So again, look at the bottom right one in green, that's the cuttlefish that mirrors what we've heard about it being a spring fishery, uh, where capturing the individuals as they go into inshore waters to breed. And because we've been, we've had this data since 2016, well, the first four years data is 2017. So we've now got almost four years, almost five years worth of data for this. And the, I've put circles around the data for cuttlefish, but you can see that from the four years, there's it looks like there's an upward trend. I wouldn't want to make too many strong conclusions from this, but 
last year seemed to be a good year for cuttlefish in terms of landings per unit effort in Sussex. And I also just wanted to mention our nearshore trawling bylaw, which was approved earlier this year. So this is part of our movement towards ecosystem based fisheries management, where you protect the essential fish habitats, such as nearshore nursery areas, including things like seagrass beds that Sarah mentioned a minute ago, uh, that support important life stages. So that's from the eggs to the larvae, to the juveniles and the adults, rather than a single species approach. Um, and I also noticed that Libby's going to talk about more about essential fish habitats. So looking forward to that. Um, so this, so for our nearshore trawling bylaw has an exclusion area along the coast, which you can see in light gray on this map. Um, and that extends out to four kilometers between Selsey and Shoreham. And to define this area, we did extensive habitat mapping across our whole district to understand what the seabed looked like. And then these maps were then used to determine the environmental value of different parts of the district and also how sensitive the different areas were to trawling activity. And that's how we came up with this trawling exclusion area. And it also includes areas where historically they used to be kelp beds. So we're hoping to see large scale habitat restoration within this trawling exclusion area with an increase in habitat complexity. And so hopefully this will also increase suitable natural egg laying substrate for cuttlefish within the district which is relevant to, I think it was Mike Barrett who asked a question about laying eggs on seaweed. Um, so hopefully that helps answer his question. And we're collaborating with a number of partners, mainly through the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project Partnership to monitor changes as a result of this trawling bylaw. So if there are any other cuttlefish related projects that anyone has ideas about, then please do get in touch. That's me done, thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Rob, Sarah, Chloe and Jen. It's really amazing to hear about the work the Ithacas have been doing and really demonstrating that evidence and ecosystem based approach. Next up is Professor Jean-Paul Robin from the University of Caen, who will be speaking about research and management in French waters. Really excited about this. Over to you, Jean-Paul. Are you there, Jean? Paul, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep, yep, can hear you now. And, and you can see the, the slide? Yep. Okay, um, thank you. Um, well, um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what we've done at the University of Caen as far as the English Channel cuttlefish population is uh, concerned. Um, the, the different points is uh, again about status and trends, exploitate stage, um, interaction between fishing fleets, um, the diagnostics that we've uh, obtained lately, and uh, the problems with uh, spatial viability and also temporal viability. And uh, in the end, um, I will um, <coughs> mention very briefly uh, what uh, uh, I know about uh, management in uh, French waters, but uh, this will be very limited. Um, the first thing, it has already been said, but uh, again, uh, we can indicate that uh, the English Channel is a major fishing ground for cephalopods and uh, the first one for cuttlefish in the, in the Atlantic area, not in the uh, European Atlantic. And um, you can see on the, the map on the, on the right that it's a shared uh, resource uh, with uh, uh, catch landings by France and, and by the UK and also uh, Belgium, Netherlands and Ireland. Um, the, the trends, um, there are several indices that suggest a, a decreasing trend in recruitment. Uh, this is something that is still being discussed, and according to the um, LPUE uh, time series that you are analyzing, uh, you may obtain different uh, results. Um, anyway, there is one uh, important change that uh, we observed in the recent years, is that uh, since 2016, uh, UK landings, uh, which are over there, are higher than uh, 
French landings. Um, <clears throat> the exploited stages for the English Channel cuttlefish population concern um, almost the, the, uh, all the stages between uh, six months and the end of the life at the end of the second year. Oh, sorry. Um, can I go back? Uh, no, sorry. Yes, okay, like that. Um, and uh, um, the, the um, juvenile and uh, pre-adults and the adults are exploited both offshore and inshore. You've already heard about that. Um, also, Sarah Clark men mentioned the, the crash project. Uh, with this project, I, I just extract here two main results, uh, which are uh, the fact that uh, um, in the central uh, part of the channel uh, in winter, uh, juvenile recruits uh, are a mix of uh, different origins, either from Torbay or for uh, the coast of Normandy in different areas. What we observed in, in the uh, offshore is really a mix of uh, these different origins. And uh, when looking at the different areas where the, the adults spawn, uh, we have a single population um, that was observed using uh, the genetic structure. Um, as far as the interaction between fishing fleets is concerned, um, there are the first stock assessment exercise that uh, were carried out, that was quite a long time ago, um, underlined the links between fishing fleets operating in sequence. Um, and of course, uh, that uh, offshore trawlers have a high impact uh, on and uh, um, the, the, the inshore trap fisheries, both uh, UK and France uh, trap fisheries uh, are sensitive uh, to uh, these uh, the, the landings or the catch uh, made by uh, trawlers um, earlier on the cohort. Um, in addition, uh, these um, assessment exercise uh, revealed that um, the high the the higher the abundance, the higher the fishing mortality. So uh, suggesting that the resource was more targeted when abundant and tended to be a barricatch when uh, less abundant. Uh, we have updated the diagnostics uh, using surplus production model fish, fitted with the uh, package SPECT uh, that was done uh, within the, uh, the Interact project CEF and CHEFS and also during uh, within the the ICS working group on cephalopods um, and uh, uh, Vladimir Lapitovsky from CFAS contributed to that. Um, the diagnostics that were carried out at the scale of the whole English Channel uh, do not indicate um, a, a dramatic situation in spite of wide confidence intervals. Oh, sorry. And uh, this is why it's difficult to uh, to analyze or to, to base advice on, on, these, um, on these results. Um, as you can see below, in 2008, we had uh, over-exploitation, and in 2019, the situation seemed bigger, better. But um, <clears throat> the, the, the problem is uh, to identify um, reference points that the, the outputs of uh, SPICT um, assessments are reference points that are only long-term average objectives. And uh, these, oh, sorry. These uh, long-term reference points uh, are not really useful in, in cephalopods. It's been already said this uh, afternoon. So um, cephalopod scientists advocate for real-time or early season assessments, as it's been published in this review. <clears throat> and one of the tools to um, uh, go in that direction uh, would be to apply generalized depletion models, as it was done by uh, Ruben Roa in the Asturias octopus fishery. Um, we have to deal with high interburn annual viability, temporal viability, but also spatial viability. And these um, uh, maps here uh, underline the, the high 
concentration of, of uh, um, cuttlefish in uh, the, the south coast of England um, <clears throat> in uh, September 2017, um, which is uh, uh, clearly a different situation from uh, the other years in, uh, in the same month of September. Um, <clears throat> this was followed by low catches in the inshore fisheries in spring. Uh, although the, the, the catch was not uh, really dramatically low. And uh, as you can see, we, we, we are not able to detect this kind of um, local or, or likely local overexploitation with uh, um, population models uh, that uh, work at the scale of the whole English Channel. So we have tried to uh, make preliminary trials to end better understand the, the concentrations uh, using uh, UK trawlers LPUE, but uh, we need to check the way we compute about indices. We need to uh, better uh, um, um, collect and, and compile uh, environmental data, and also to uh, um, work on the kind of statistical models you, that we use. Um, <clears throat> we have already um, predicted um, squid abundance in the English Channel using environmental data. Sorry, uh, this has not done has not been done so far in the case of cuttlefish, but it would be really necessary. And um, uh, I can add to this slide uh, the fact that if we do that in cuttlefish, we may have to take into account. Um, Interspecific interactions. Uh, we have a, um, a, a recent work using uh, DNA barcoding on the squid stomach contents uh, that showed us that uh, in almost one third of the squid stomachs, we had cuttlefish. So, uh, about uh, the local measures that are uh, applied so far. Uh, the offshore fishery for cuttlefish is not managed, and the only regulations that apply to offshore trawlers are related to other stocks. For instance, the, the trawler's um, uh, mesh size is sorry um, is uh, something that is related to the exploitation of uh, teleost fish. Um, the the lack of uh, minimal landing size is a problem. Uh, since, oh, sorry, you, there are EU sorting categories, uh, which are weight categories, but uh, these categories are just indicative and, and uh, uh, sm smaller specimen than the, uh, than the minimum uh, limit are also landed. Uh, in, in Normandy, uh, the um, inshore fishery is mainly a mix, oh, sorry, between trap fishing and inshore trawlers, um, and the, the special interactions, the, the areas where traps can be uh, put and, and the, the areas where inshore trawlers can uh, uh, fish, uh, this is managed at the local scale by Comité des Pêches. Uh, there is uh, a system with uh, licenses, which are supposed to limit the number of trap fishers, um, but um, I, I do not have the the, the updated numbers, uh, but it's what it, what it seems is that it seemed to be uh, decreasing, and the number of traps is also uh, limited uh, to a hundred traps per man on board. Um, as far as uh, inshore trawling, we still have the, a problem with uh, uh, derogations that are given to uh, trawling within the three nautical miles. Uh, limits and uh, th this is something that is uh, asked uh, in spring to catch uh, adults but uh, I've already said that the selectivity was uh, uh, poor and uh, uh, it's also asked um, at the end of summer beginning of uh, autumn and in that case it's mainly to catch uh, juvenile cuttlefish which is against the, the scientific advice. So the last uh, slide I could show you 
which is not recent. It's uh, it was uh, prepared in 2015 or in 2016 for using 2015 data. And at that uh, time, uh, along the coast of France, uh, there were um, a kind of a, a shift between uh, tram. Oh, sorry, channel nets that were uh, used in the in the northeast uh, parts, and uh, in Normandy, the, the uh, main gear was uh, trap nets. Oh, and um, uh, as well as uh, the same in in uh, Brittany. Thank you. Um, got to stop sharing. Thank you, Jean-Paul. That was absolutely fascinating to hear about what kind of research you've been doing with, uh, in France. And I'm sure people have a lot of questions about it in the Q&A. So thank you for that. Um, I'm now going to introduce Libby West, Senior Specialist, Marine and Fisheries, uh, who's a Senior Specialist um, for Marine and Fisheries Evidence at Natural England. And she's going to tell us all about essential fish habitat. Over to you, Libby. Thanks, Morvin. Thanks, everyone, for a really interesting discussion so far. Um, First of all, I just want to say that this is more of a conceptual uh, talk today. We're not talking about implementing essential fish habitat imminently, um, but I'm aware that it's a term that's floating around. It's getting more interest. There's a lot of research being done that's being branded kind of under the EFH um, sort of heading. And I just want to think about where we're at, where it could go next, and uh, have a bit of a think about what it might mean for cuttlefish fisheries if we applied it. And it's great to see that actually some of the IFCAs are already implementing this kind of management. It's really exciting. So what is essential fish habitat? Well, the term itself comes from uh, the US. So they had uh, a law input into their main fisheries bill in 1996 um, that basically asked uh, their fisheries agencies to um, identify in the first instance and then designate essential fish habitat um, really broadly. <clears throat> and it, it was a really interesting example of, of where um, a mandate was given before the science had really taken shape. So it resulted in a huge amount of research and a lot of what we know about fish habitat interactions uh, comes from the US because of that. And what's really interesting is NOAA, uh, who managed the federal fisheries in the US, really use this uh, the, the tool essential fish habitat is in their sort of um, engagement as it, it's the foundation of America's seafood and fisheries it's underpinning uh, this you know multi 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 million dollar industry in the states um, and it's it's that very strong link of this is a management tool to support fisheries. Um, when we start to think about what that might mean for UK policy um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how it's actually implemented in the states later. Um, it sounds like something that's relatively simple. You understand we all know what a fish is. Um, we know what habitats are. So identifying essential fish habitat should be relatively straightforward. Well, in the last uh, sort of two months, I've been to three workshops um, with a mixture of scientists and fisheries managers discussing what essential fish habitat might look like in the UK. And they were both really interesting, well-managed workshops. But we got quite tied up in knots over both the terms essential and habitat because they're both scientific questions, i.e. how do you define them, to what level, at what scale, um, and they're also policy questions. What do we as society deem to be essential? We can't protect everything, so we have to make some pragmatic decisions. Um, so very quickly, it gets complex, and something that seems like it should be relatively straightforward to delineate um, actually does get a wee bit more complicated. Um, so we, I think we need to go back to basics a little bit, um, and maybe Cuttlefish are a good example of us thinking about that. Why, why might we want to designate EFH in the first place? And when I say designate, <clears throat> that might not be, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about marine protected areas. It might be something completely different. But what are the reasons that make us think that we need to protect habitat for fish in the first place? Um, <clears throat> and following on from that, what is Natural England's interest in this? We, you know, we're not fisheries managers. We pro provide conservation advice uh, primar primarily on marine protected areas. Well, Natural England um, do provide advice on some designated fish species and shellfish like spiny lobster um, and black bream. Um, but we also provide advice on fish that are um, preyed upon by other designated features like uh, harbour porpoise and seals. Um, and with an increasing focus on ecosystem based management, if you're managing either marine protected areas or providing conservation advice for the marine area more generally, um, it's becoming harder and harder to ignore fish as part of that system. It just doesn't make sense. Um, 
increasingly we're looking at a natural capital approach um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the term um, for sort of us for a sort of more uh, biological science background it, it's quite a new one um, it's about understanding the value of nature and integrating that into the decisions we make about our economy and society um, and that includes sort of putting monetary values on ecosystem services and habitats if we don't understand the linkage between fish and habitats, then we could potentially underestimate the value of a, of a habitat um, uh, to society. So that's why Natural England is interested. Um, where is EFH? So how do we start to decide where essential fish habitat is um, and what it is? And, and this is where I said I'd, I'd talk a little bit more about its impl implementation in the US. And it's a little bit of a cautionary tale. So in the US, um, essential fish habitat is um, described as those waters and substrates necessary to fish for spawning, breeding, feeding or growth to maturity, which is pretty much anywhere that a fish uses. There's other than maybe some sort of overwintering behaviours where they're not feeding, um, that doesn't leave a lot that wouldn't require protection, which again isn't a very pragmatic approach. Again, that ties in with how do we actually study um, or research where essential fish habitats are. And there are four kind of levels of information. One is presence absence. One is the density of fish or juvenile fish, if we're looking at nursery areas. Um, the third is the growth, reproductive, uh, reproduction and survival. So how much are those habitats um, actually allowing fish to grow? Are they feeding really well? And by the time you get into that level of information, that is, um, it requires quite a lot of uh, quite hefty scientific work uh, and potentially quite expensive. And then the fourth level of information, which again would allow you to really narrow down where those essential fish habitats are, are actual production rates. So how much are they, those areas contributing or habitats contributing to the overall um, uh, population? And again, you're, you're starting to look at quite costly and involved research, and you're probably not going to be able to do that throughout the range of one species, let alone um, multiple species. So I think there's a bit of a cautionary tale um, learned from the US and the research that they've done. Um, what has happened over there is, um, for example, uh, for one of their species of um, coastal flounder, they looked at where essential fish habitat was under the definition of uh, spawning, breeding, feeding, or maturity, growth to maturity areas. And it, they did find that it was basically the whole of the east coast of the states. So they then had to define critical fish areas, which were those areas where they were either higher density or they were growing, reproducing and surviving better. So I think we need to bear that in mind when we start to think about designating essential fish habitat in UK waters. <clears throat> so just trying to think about what that might mean for cuttlefish. So we've talked about how they have this really complex life history and um, they have these inshore offshore and actually I've learned today that they have inshore multiple inshore offshore migrations. Um, we have juveniles in coastal waters that are obviously using uh, seagrass beds um, and laying uh, adults laying eggs inshore. Um, and I think there's some work to show that the adults don't necessarily just lay eggs in one location, they can move up and down the coastline laying eggs multiple times on different substrata. And even um, some of the work from the Crash project showed that um, as much as the cuttlefish are laying their eggs in those seagrass beds, they actually spend the majority of their time on sandy habitats just outside. So actually habitat mosaics might be really important cuttlefish areas. Um, we might just need to consider more than just the seagrass. And I think it comes back to those earlier questions. What are the management goals? How would designating essential fish habitat for species, uh, species fit into that wider management plan and wider management goals? It's not going to be a fix in its own right, and it needs to be one tool that's used alongside other management mechanisms. And it might look different for each species, depending on what we want to do. So <clears throat> again, sort of taking a step back to think about what those management objectives might need to be. And again, this will differ for different species, but for example, uh, designating essential fish habitat might help us to ensure that fish have the habitats that they require to carry out their life histories. Um, it'll help us to understand the fish's role in ecosystems and that's commercial species and non-commercial species. Because if you think about it, you know, cuttlefish have only been a commercial species for 20 or so years. If we were doing this 
research, you know, 30 years ago, we might have completely dismissed cuttle as being important. And it's likely to happen again in the future that fisheries and markets open up for species we hadn't considered before. So we need to try and uh, think about commercial and non-commercial species. Hopefully designating uh, essential fish habitat might help us to make more informed decisions about how we use the marine environment and that might be commercial fishing, um, but also um, other activities, um, offshore wind farms uh, are developing at a very fast pace, for example. And I think it really has to help us to prioritise areas that we want to manage um, so that we don't just uh, go for this approach of everything's important, therefore we can't protect anything. So if we're thinking about translating EFH into UK policy, I think there's a couple of alternatives and I think that they ultimately will both need to be used. One would be a species focused approach and, and certainly cuttlefish seem like a really good candidate potentially as part of a wider management plan. Um, for areas or habitats which are critical for species to carry out their life cycle. Um, where there are concerns for those habitats or populations. And also habitat focused um, uh, essential fish habitat designation where one habitat might produce um, multiple benefits to multiple species uh, exactly like Sussex Sifka's um, bylaw for protecting uh, and improving kelp. So it comes back to the what do we do about it? Where does this sit within our policy landscape? We already have marine protected areas. There's a lot of designation out there already. Um, the fishing industry is feeling the impacts of those designations um, and we have concerns about um, displacement. I think the answer is probably in the long term going to be that it's not going to be one statute or policy, but it's going to be a range of tools depending on the management objectives and species ecology. Um, you know, bearing in mind for some species there's no spawn or recruit relationships and thinking about um, those life cycles where where is our best bang for buck in terms of protecting different elements of that life history. Um, so as part of that, fisheries management plans could play a really important tool uh, for potentially um, forcing us to look for essential fish habitat, potentially designating it and managing it as part of that wider species ecology. If bylaws are already doing the job in places, um, EFH does now uh, appear in some marine plan policies and that might be something we see increasing. Um, uh, we could look at existing MPAs and what they already offer and whether uh, new management within those MPAs might increase that further. And also the MMO does have bylaw making powers outside of MPAs. So there are lots of options um, and I think we need to not shut down any of those routes yet. Um, but obviously FMPs are probably something that is on a lot of our mind. A key requirement um, for the development of essential fish habitat. Uh, these are things that we're thinking about when we look at the kind of casework that we get in Natural England. It needs to apply across regulatory regimes or at least be implemented in different places um, so that it applies to fishing and other industries. Um, we don't want to see uh, one industry uh, sort of suffering and then uh, it not being applied elsewhere. The management needs to be designed to fit the problem you know it's only worthwhile protecting a certain life history stage if we're confident that that will have a benefit to the population and also we've discussed you know cuttlefish um, uh, ranges changing so any ideally any management mechanism would be adaptive and flexible and we're going to have to be prioritized and pragmatic we don't have bottomless pits of funding for doing the research initially or for um, going through the process of identifying, um, possibly designating and managing essential fish habitat. Um, and we certainly need more research and monitoring. And I think for the kind of scale of the question and the task at hand, it needs to be collaborative and innovative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was excellent. I think a really good segue into our final speaker in this section, Dr. Rebecca Corder, Senior Policy Advisor um, for DEFRA, who is go for of Senior Policy Advisor of Fishery Management Plans at DEFRA, who will update us on progress with fisheries management plans and the English Front Runner Programme. Over to you, Rebecca. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much again for organising such a fascinating and informative uh, symposium this uh, this afternoon. Thank you for having me today to talk about the uh, fisheries, uh, the fisheries management plans, and the English Front Runner Programme. 
Uh, so why fisheries management plans? Well, the UK is now an independent coastal state that must manage its own fisheries, which recognise the needs of those people whose livelihoods depend on the sustainable fisheries. Uh, the Fisheries Act, um, published in 2022, places a legal obligation on DEFRA to prepare and publish fisheries management plans. DEFRA see these as an opportunity to work in partnership with stakeholders to ensure that fisheries are sustainable over the long term. We want our fisheries to be able to support these, support a revitalised and profitable fishing industry, uh, support vibrant coastal communities and support a healthy marine environment. But what is a fisheries management plan? Well, the Fisheries Act describes a fisheries management plan as a document that sets out policies designed to restore one or more stocks of sea fish or to maintain them at sustainable levels. FMPs, uh, or fisheries management plans, will also help us achieve other fisheries objectives, which include environmental, social and economic issues. Plans will be based on best available scientific advice and can be prepared by either the government, public bodies or industry groups, all of these which would be collaborating with stakeholders. It would then come back to DEFRA, who would then hold a public consultation, and then it would be down to DEFRA to publish these plans once they'd received sign-off by ministers. Once published, the National Fisheries Authority must exert their functions in relation to each of the relevant FMPs, and then each published FMP will be regularly reviewed and monitored. Um, so what's contained within, FM, within an FMP? So the Fisheries Act sets out certain mandatory elements which must be picked up within an FMP. Uh, FMPs must set out the plan's remit and objectives. They must set out the available evidence. They must identify governance policies and actions required to secure sustainable exploitation of the particular stock that's relevant to that FMP. They must set out the indicator success uh, and then set out the monitoring plan, which will use these indicators to assess the plan's effectiveness. And they must set out the review schedule. But uh, DEFRA have wider ambitions for these plans. And so uh, there are other things that the FMPs uh, can pick up, such as identifying policies and actions to address wider management objectives, including how to achieve um, social and economic benefits from fishing, and also identifying policies and actions to address wider environmental and climate concerns. FMPs, as I mentioned beforehand, will be reviewed and will evolve over time. Um, FMPs are a new venture, uh, so there's a lot of unknowns in how to take this process forward. So what DEFRA are doing is planning to pilot a small number of English plans in 2022. Um, these are known as front runners. They will allow us to examine some key questions, such as how best to uh, how best to include, sorry, how best to achieve inclusive and equitable participation in the development of the plans, how best to balance social, economic, and environmental interests in fisheries management, and how best to tackle wider environmental challenges when setting goals for fisheries. The lessons learned from this process will then inform the next phase of the FMP program. We've been working closely with policy colleagues, stakeholders and the devolved administrations to agree a list of um, proposed FMPs for the joint fishery statement. This will go out for consultation in early 2022. With the help of stakeholders again and policy colleagues, we've also, also been finalising a small number of these, uh, of these English, uh, English focused FMP projects to start next year. We're currently seeking ministerial, approach, uh, ministerial approval for this list um, alongside securing necessary funds to take these, process, take these plans forward. We're also developing evidence strategies, so we're keen to hear from yourselves regarding what are the evidence priorities for these FMPs. Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to answering any questions you might have in the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and I think it's going to be so important for everyone here who cares about cuttlefish and other species to feed into that process. I'm going to hand over to Jacob now, who's going to guide the Q&A. Thanks, Marvin. Thanks all. So yes, if all speakers from that section could just um, pop back on their videos. Um, I think our first speaker, 
uh, yeah, Dr. Chris Barrett has unfortunately had to leave, but um, as far as I'm aware, everyone else is here. So I'm going to start off with um, merging a couple that are on a similar theme that I think several of the IFCAs touched on and uh, Libby did as well. Um, so this one's carried over from an earlier session, but is very pertinent here. Matt Slater from the Cornwall Wildlife Trust asks, are there any specific areas where overwintering cuttlefish are found in which fishing could be managed um, to help with management? Um, and in a similar vein, Appin Williamson asks uh, to one of the IFCAs, but I think perhaps Libby, this might also apply to you, says a few years ago, research by CFAS indicated juveniles dominated landings from specific areas of the Western Channel by the trawl fleet. Could these indicate spatial or temporal closures are needed to protect these aggregations? Does anyone want to come in on that to start off? I'll, I'll start off if that's okay. I, I, it was really interesting to hear about the size classes potentially aggregating um, uh, so much. And I think it's another call for, you know, at least offshore, we do have VMS data, but I think, um, you know, we all know that there are data gaps and uh, the sort of scale and resolution of some of the data collection could be improved, um, sort of move towards REM and things like that. So I think, um, yes, potentially if there are cuttlefish that aggregate by size classes and if the management objectives that are set for cuttlefish um, suggest that a certain size class would benefit from protection, then it's really positive that they show that aggregating behaviour um, that suggests that they, they might be a really suitable candidate for spatial management. And that, be, that might be management of their habitat or it might be management of a, a sort of spatial area regardless of the habitat. So there's, there's lots of different options, but I think the one thing we need to be really cautious about is making sure that if we're using spatial management, it's targeted at the right life history stage to have um, an impact. Um, there's been lots and lots of research on other species that actually you need to have really quite huge spatial closures um, to if you wanted to sort of use spatial management as the only tool. So I think it's seeing it as part of a toolbox rather than the, the only option. You know, I think ultimately you need to have some kind of limit on catch potentially, um, as well as spatial management. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Sarah, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I just wanted to come um, come in on that. I mean, um, I was aware of what happened in 2017. Um, it was quite an extraordinary occurrence, really, when um, the um, landings increased so much. It was as though the um, the trawling fleet we have always been aware of the beam trawlers working offshore in the mid-channel and bringing large landings into Brixham in particular. Um, but that year, it was almost as though the um, trawling fleet, the otter trawlers, sort of by chance intersected that kind of migration of cuttlefish that Jean-Paul mentioned from the mid-channel back into their, their spawning areas. And once one vessel was landing cuttlefish into Brixham, on a smaller, you know, smaller vessel, they encouraged all other vessels to actually go and prosecute that fishery as well, because obviously it became a bonanza as such, and it has sort of maintained since then. So I think we have to be very careful about where you where you, the fishery might intercept any migration of the species <laughs> and how we could manage that um, spatially. So it's, it's a lot to think about because that might not always be the case. It was it seemed to occur in that in that um, fashion. I might be wrong and there might be others here who have much more um, and much more information about it. But I remember looking on AIS and I could not believe that how suddenly in a short period of time a lot of boats just seemed to find that point when the migration was happening. And so, you know, it, it will flex. It's not, it's, it's not certain and we, we have to be mindful of that. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Um, perhaps that's something, Jean-Paul, maybe you have insight in that area. Yeah, uh, I'd like just to add uh, one uh, indication. Uh, I've showed you that uh, uh, in the case of squid, we had uh, uh, developed predictive um, uh, models uh, using environmental data to predict recruitment. Um, we could do that also in, uh, in, in, the, in the cultural fish, and we are planning to do it. But um, the, the, so far, even in squid, we haven't uh, published or, or um, uh, used uh, or, or sent the information to uh, the fishermen 
because uh, in the lack of uh, a regulation or, or a system that would limit uh, the fishermen, if we say uh, that uh, we predict a high abundance, uh, we most likely will also predict a high fishing mortality. So uh, uh, it, it, this is something that uh, really, uh, as, as scientists, we, we are preparing the, the, so, some aspect of assessments or predictions, but um, the way it is implemented or it is used, uh, this definitely has to be a, a concerted management uh, together with the stakeholders. Okay, thank you very much. Does anyone else want to come in on that before we move on? Okay, we have a question from Rebecca Mitchell uh, for any of the IFCA speakers, who asks, do you anticipate that the new under 10 catch app data will provide uh, useful spatial data on cuttlefish catches for inshore vessels? Um, if, if I may, um, yeah, I, I think that it would be really useful. It's not only the catch app, um, I mean, that is uh, out quite widely at the moment. Um, I know that um, the MMO, or I believe the MMO are looking to um, really sort of implement that next year, but also the rollout nationally of IVMS um, for all vessels and have, having that linkage. I mean, we have IVMS on our mobile fleet within our district, so we're able to look at where all the um, trawlers, scallopers are operating out to six miles. But having that across all vessels, all sizes, all fleets, well, actually, and, and then linking it with the catch app and linking it with landings. And we've done some work on linking IVMS with landings and sales notes. It actually starts to get a much better picture of where activity is happening and the, and the value of the, the fisheries in those areas. And therefore, you can also then focus on where those activities are happening and potentially what management we talked about knowing where the, the spatial areas are that. Uh, that cuttlefish might aggregate or, 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 or whatever. So I think that that's key. I think it's, I mean, I, the work that I've been doing recently has just been eye-opening about the use of IVMS and linking it with landings and any, any catch app or anything that shows the sale. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, anything to add to that from anyone else? Okay, we've got a question um, for Rebecca Corder. Um, will FMPs have the capacity to cross-cut inshore and offshore management? Um, I think the DEFRA are very keen to support holistic management, but um, obviously FMPs must act through existing legal mechanisms, so there might need to be some inshore and offshore coordination, depending on what the issue is at hand. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, um, there's another question for Sarah here as well. Um, in the inshore fisheries, do you find the trawls have an impact on the eggs that the cuttlefish lay on the substrate? Oh, mm. You're muted at the moment. There Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, as I as I described, um, really our, our focus has been on trawl bay and looking at the impact of trawling on the mud habitat. Um, that's that's cuttlefish trawling, and because um, we have that gradation from the seagrass in trawl bay into sand and sort of muddy sandy habitat so and then it goes into mud so you've got the actual subtidal habitat and really that the cuttlefish coming in to lay their eggs on you know seagrass or as Libby said seaweeds or any artificial structure they can find such as a wood and rope and pots um, I haven't heard of any impact actually within the mud habitat which is slightly slightly deeper water away from that shallow water where the seagrass and, and the algae are found, you know, deeper than sort of 10 meters. So I haven't been aware of that. No. Obviously the trawlers can't go any shallower, so um, they shouldn't be having an impact unless they're doing that illegally. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, one last question here for Rebecca, for Rebecca Corder as well. Um, how can DEFRA work with the MMO on cuttlefish management offshore? How are you working currently and could that expand in the future? Um, so we, um, we have been working closely with the MMO. They are the, um, the regulatory fishery authority and that, are, that we're working closely with um, for the FMP process. We, um, so, um, We've been working with both them, our policy colleagues, um, other colleagues, um, to develop a set of criteria through which we could 
identify what uh, what FMPs should would be taken forward. Um, so cuttlefish have been listed as a key species there. Um, those plans in terms of how they'd be arranged under you know, geographic or, or sites or um, species specific remits is still under consideration. Um, I think when it comes to um, the uh, the actual um, I guess the, the policy development that that is maybe one that I could take away for our uh, shell my shellfish colleagues. I'm not sure if Matt Johnson is on is um, is uh, is attending or is still is still online at the moment because he might be able to pick that one up. But um, but we will be working. You know, we will be working closely with the MMO uh, with the progression of the FMP process. Thank you, Rebecca. I can see um, Matt Johnson is online and has just raised his hand. I wonder if um, one of our tech people in the background. There we go. Hi, Matt. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was trying to talk then, but I think I was on mute. Um, but no, just to add to that, just to say that we're going to be working pretty closely with MMO, Seafish and CFAS. they all kind of considered to be delivery partners for the FMPs. Um, so it's not just like collaboration consultation. We are working as a group to deliver these. So yeah, that communication is gonna be ongoing throughout. Fab, thank you. Okay, I think that's about it um, for the questions, I'm, I'm afraid, but um, if there are any outstanding ones or outstanding points people want to raise, um, I believe there's going to be um, a workshop in the spring that can help you out with that. Um, but I'll hand over to Sam and to, to Morvin who can finish you off and uh, let you know what comes next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, um, Jacob, Morvan, and all our speakers in this last session. Um, sorry, we've run out of time, but as Jacob says, we, we will have more time in the spring when we can bring some of these questions forward. I, I think we can all agree that there's a great deal more to discuss, but that we do know quite a bit about this fishery um, and that a lot of effort is going into better inshore management. Um, but until we get a handle on the offshore fishery, the positive effect of those efforts will undoubtedly be compromised. And on behalf of Blue, I think we feel we need to move quite quickly to avoid a collapse in that inshore static gear fishery um, for the future. So just to round up, um, I'd just like to outline the next steps following this event. Um, first of all, we'll be producing a report um, which will be circulated to all of you and that'll summarise the symposium presentations and discussion. Um, and there'll also be the recording which will be made available so you can revisit some of the amazing presentations and uh, in-depth information that's been shared today. And we'll draw on this to input the consultation on fisheries management plans and priorities that were outlined by Rebecca earlier, uh, earlier this afternoon. And depending on the timing of that consultation, we'll be holding a, a full day workshop, which we hope, cross fingers, will be in person uh, in the spring. Um, at which we hope we'll see many of you there in person. And at that, we'd like to progress some collaborative development of measures um, that will protect cuttlefish populations and sustainable fisheries. So finally, I'd just like to extend a huge thank you to all our speakers today for sharing their insights and experience. And in particular, Chris Barrett, Libby West and Rob Clark, who really helped shape, shape the programme. But thank you to all of you very much indeed. And thanks to Paul, Becky and Jacob and the team from Mindfully Wild Communications for all their support in making the event run so smoothly. Um, and I'd also just like to do a shout out to Paul Naylor, who I think we had credited all his photos in some of the slides, but I noticed that the Zoom taskbar was covering them up. So thank you, Paul. Um, finally, um, thank you to everyone for your participation and engagement. We hope you really enjoyed the event and got lots out of it. Look forward to seeing some of you in person in the spring to take this discussion forward and really create the action that's needed to protect our cuttlefish populations and support sustainable fisheries for the long term. So I'm going to leave you now with another moment of cuttlefish magic to ease you into the end of the day um, with another showing of, of that video. Um, just thank you all again and I hope you all have a really good evening. Bye.